Welcome uh, to Uncover's third annual online conference. Uh, my name's Ruth McQuillan, and along with um, Ev Ropi Theodoratu, I co-lead Uncover. So Evie and I will be taking turns to chair different sessions uh, tomorrow and today. It's really great to have so many people joining us for this conference. For those of you who are new to Uncover, I'll just tell you a little bit about us uh, before we start. So we were born in the earliest days of the COVID-19 pandemic in March 2020. We set ourselves up to mobilise a sort of really a volunteer army of public health and epidemiology staff and postgraduate students with the aim of responding to the needs of policymakers and decision makers. So if you think back to that time, politicians had to make really momentous decisions in situations of great uncertainty. There was very little known about this, uh, this organism and, and, how, and, and what was going to happen. So we thought that we might have some useful skills that might be able to help in that situation. We set ourselves up so that we could quickly find, evaluate and synthesize relevant evidence in response to requests from a range of decision makers, policy makers, uh, people in, in, in various um, roles in, in government and public services about a whole range of different questions, including school closures, the effectiveness of masks, how COVID transmitted in indoor and outdoor um, uh, situations and so on. So two and a half years later, we're still going strong, although as COVID hopefully becomes a less acute issue, our focus is changing. So the purpose of this conference is partly about looking back at the work that we've done over the last year and the lessons that we've learned, and partly about looking forward and exploring where Uncover might go next. So just before we start, uh, some very brief housekeeping. So there'll be three short, uh, there'll, be, there'll be four sessions today and there'll be uh, three short breaks between the sessions. And during those short breaks, there'll be some, some posters and, and videos displayed um, if you want to watch those. So as attendees, you will not be able to share your audio or your, or your video feed, but we really want to hear from you. We really want to hear um, your questions. So there's a question and answer panel. If you could put those any questions in that panel and as as chair of the session, I'll be looking at those um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll be able to ask them on your behalf at the end of each session. And you, you can also um, vote on the questions. So if, if you see a question that you think is a, a really good one, um, you can just uh, indicate that by, by voting on that, that question and it will put it up the list. So we'll, I'll choose a selection um, of, of the best questions or the most popular questions um, and I'll put them to our speakers. The other thing to say is that the webinar, webinar is being recorded. So the first, uh, the focus of the first day of our conference is on infectious diseases and future pandemic preparedness. And we've got a superb keynote speaker to get us started. For those of you who spent the pandemic here in the UK, Professor Mark Woolhouse hardly needs an introduction as he was a regular fixture on the UK media, helping us to make sense of the turbulent and sometimes, frankly, quite frightening times that we were all living through. Mark is uh, a professor of infectious disease epi epidemiology at the Usher Insti Institute um, in the College of Medicine and Veterinary Medicine here at the University of Edinburgh. And he's a highly prolific and eminent researcher. He's got a really varied um, background. Um, he holds a bachelor's degree in zoology from the University of Oxford, an MSc in biological computation from the University of York, and a PhD in biology from the University of Canberra. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and of the Academy of Medical Sciences, and was awarded an OBE in 2002 for services to the control of infectious diseases. We're really delighted to have him here today to open our conference and give the keynote address. 
The title of Mark's talk is Post-COVID Pandemic Preparedness, and it's his reflection of what we learned during the COVID pandemic and the lessons that we need to learn to be better prepared next time. So over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Ruth. Uh, if I can have the first slide, I'll, I will say something about post-COVID pandemic preparedness. But first, can I declare myself to be a huge fan of Uncover? Uh, I think it played a really important role uh, in that first year, particularly uh, of the pandemic, for all the reasons that Ruth has just outlined. I used it several times to support my own work as part of some of the government advisory committees, both for the UK and for Scotland. And in my own submission to the ongoing inquiries, the Hallett inquiry in particular, I used Uncover as an example of the sort of initiative I thought should be more formally supported and nurtured by government uh, as we prepare for future pandemics. So I'm a huge fan of Uncover and thank you for all you've done. Next slide, please. I'd also like to thank a large number of researchers in my own group who actually did the bulk of the work that I'm going to talk about this afternoon and also acknowledge some valued colleagues uh, from the University of Edinburgh and beyond who have contributed to the thinking underlying that work. I should say that all the opinions of this are my own, but but it are based on a huge amount of work by a lot of people, uh, often under very difficult circumstances during the pandemic. So thanks to all of them. Next slide, please. I don't think this audience really needs reminding of the huge toll that COVID-19 has exerted on the whole world. The latest estimate published in The Lancet this year is that more than 18 million people have died of the infection. There's a huge and mostly unquantified burden of both acute and chronic illness, a lot of it very severe as well. Healthcare systems have been overstretched and in some places and in some times overwhelmed as a result of COVID. Schools and universities have been closed for, for months in the UK, for two years in places like Uganda and the Philippines, huge educational toll there. Massive economic burden, huge public debt, uh, lower GDP, markedly lower in 2020 in particular, thousands of lost livelihoods. Undoubtedly, this is a major contributor to the economic woes we're currently experiencing, although not, of course, the only one, but it is uh, arguably by far the largest. Uh, the mental health harms, well, I, I think most of us who work in universities uh, or more widely have, have seen these accumulate uh, over time. They, they've been quite dramatic and really quite worrying. Um, and all as a result of the suspension of normal life as our preferred method, if you like, of, of dealing or responding to this pandemic. And the net long-term damage of that is still being assessed. It will be assessed over the coming years. And my guess is it'll take a generation or more before we really know how much harm was done. Next slide, please. Before the pandemic, there was a lot of preparedness planning going on. And a study in 2019 called the, Glo I'm sorry, the, big one, the Global Health Security Index assessed over 30 indicators of that preparedness, the resilience of the health system, uh, the ability to respond rapidly, and so on. And that survey covered almost 200 countries that had signed up to the international health regulations, 205. And the top two of those countries were the USA and the UK. So you don't really need a lot of statistical analysis to work out that the two best prepared countries in the world, we thought in 2020, were actually two of the worst affected, particularly in that first year of the pandemic. So there's clearly a mismatch there. Uh, and that mismatch has been confirmed by a number of other studies. Uh, another paper earlier this year in The Lancet concluded that pandemic preparedness indices were not meaningfully associated with either infection rates or infection fatality rates due to COVID-19. We've done a little bit of this work our, ourselves. One of my other hats is as the director of an organization called TIBA, which supports health research among a number of partners, partner countries in Africa. And during the pandemic, we were working very closely with the World Health Organization Africa region uh, on analyzing what went wrong and what went well in the pandemic response in Africa. The plot on the right hand side, don't worry about the details, you just need to see the shape of it. It's the stringency of response, i.e. the severity of lockdown on the, the x-axis and on the vertical axis, 
the per capita mortality rate in the first wave. Uh, you can immediately see there's no obvious correlation across countries. Those are all different countries in Africa. And that sort of result has been re reproduced at all sorts of scales. It's very difficult to show that correlation. But what you can do is categorize the countries. And the ones in red there are the ones that both had a very severe response. They endured very harsh lockdowns and also had a very high per capita mortality rate. And we can look at predictors of that. And that's the, the other plot there. And there are two of them that come out. One of them is within Africa, levels of urbanization. That's not surprising. That fits with what we know about the epidemiology of COVID-19. Uh, but also this resilience. And this is actually a marker, an index developed by the RAND Corporation uh, that looked at infectious diseases resilience in terms of ability to cope with outbreaks. And the ability to cope with outbreaks, according to that index, is a positive, positive predictor of a bad outcome. So the moral of this is what we have traditionally considered high preparedness, well-prepared countries, does not make them less vulnerable. It doesn't equate with low vulnerability. And I think we have to be very careful in our thinking about what preparedness and vulnerability mean, because they're quite clearly different things. Next slide, please. What might come next? Well, the WHO has this category, public health emergencies of international concern, essentially a precursor to a pandemic that they've used a number of times over the last decade or so. For swine flu, for polio, for Ebola, for Zika, Ebola again, COVID-19, and most recently for monkeypox. And everybody expects that there will be more public health emergencies of international concern over the coming years. Even those are only the tip of the iceberg. The map there with the black dots is a WHO publication showing significant infectious disease outbreaks around the world. So only a minority of those become public health emergencies and only, thankfully, a minority of those go on to become pandemics. COVID-19 was interesting in that list because it's the only one that was caused by an infectious agent we didn't already know about. So this is the disease X phenomenon the uh, possibility that the next pandemic, and indeed the next next pandemic, will be caused by something we don't yet know about. And again, there's general agreement, this is a quote from the World Health Organization, that COVID-19 will not be the last disease X. So we face the threat of infectious disease outbreak caused by viruses that we know about, but also ones that we simply don't know about yet, and therefore we don't know their properties. Next slide, please. In the face of that threat, and in response to what we've all been through for the last two years, it's no surprise that there has been an explosion in the number of preparedness plans. Pretty much every government, every health agency, international agency, uh, many NGOs, many funders have all contributed to this growing literature on pandemic preparedness. And I've listed some of the most high profile examples then. I'm going to speak mostly to one produced by the G7 called the 100 Days Mission to Respond to Future Pandemic Threats. Uh, it's a very authoritative document. It's uh, introduced by Patrick Vallance, the UK's Chief Scientific Advisor, and Melinda French-Gates. So it has a lot of authority behind it. Next slide, please. This 100 Days Mission that the plan refers to is the interval between WHO declaring a public health emergency and the approval of technologies to combat the infectious disease threat, in the three categories, mostly diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. So the 100 days covers the development, the trials, and the approval of these technologies, but not the rollout. And the aim is to get this down to 100 days. What I've done here is color-coded the interval it took to get these various technologies approved during the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And you'll see there's only one green one. The only thing we actually did in 100 days that time was develop the RT-PCR test, which is extraordinarily helpful. We would have been flying blind without that test, but it was possible to develop quickly and, and we knew it would be. For some reason that I still don't understand, the point of care tests, which ought to be also fairly straightforward, took an awful lot longer. The therapeutics and the vaccines all took an awful lot longer. The only one that came close to the 100 days target was the Chinese vaccine Sinovac based on killed virus technology, which is not generally regarded as the best available uh, of the, vac the COVID-19 vaccines. So we are talking about a major shift 
in getting these intervals down to 100 days. It's far, far better than anything we achieved in 2020. Next slide, please. Even then, the pandemic is not over. Mass vaccination began immediately the first vaccines were approved in the UK on December the 8th, 2020. But we were living with restrictions until July the 19th, over 200 days later. And during that period, more than half, and I stress this, more than half of the COVID deaths in the UK happened after mass vaccination began. So it's not the end of the pandemic. And at a global scale, half the global population was still unvaccinated over 300 days after the vaccination programs had begun. And over that interval, three quarters of confirmed COVID deaths occurred. So it's not really 100 days, even if 100 days was achievable. It's 100 days plus a long interval, 100, 200 days or perhaps more for rolling out these technologies. Next slide, please. So what does the G7 say about this? Well, in those 100 days, or as I rebadge it, the 100 days plus, essentially it's relying on non-pharmaceutical interventions. And the first in its list is social distancing. So it does talk about measures that would have made contact safe, hygiene, PPE, physical distancing, ventilation, testing, case detection, self-isolation, and so on. But the first thing in its list is social distancing, reducing the number of contacts, all the ways that we experienced uh, during 2020, 2021. And although the G7 report doesn't use the word, put all those together and what you've got is lockdown. Next slide, please. So I think before endorsing a plan that says essentially that we risk being put in lockdown until a vaccine becomes available in the next pandemic, we should have a, a really critical assessment of whether lockdown strategy worked well in the UK and elsewhere in 2020-21. And when you're doing that sort of comparison, it's very important to choose your counterfactual carefully. The initial justification for lockdown back in March 2020 was that if we didn't lock down, we were, we were told this in the media, up to half a million people in the UK could die. The problem with that scenario is that, that really is if we did not just not have lockdown, we did absolutely nothing. That people just carried on behaving as normal as the pandemic raged amongst us and literally thousands of people were dying. Well, obviously, that's a completely unrealistic scenario. So when you say, did lockdown work, what are you comparing it with? And studies that have looked at that in uh, with more care, the results are definitely arguable. There, there are arguments on both sides, but it looks as though the marginal benefit of the full lockdown was actually very small, um, certainly of the more extreme versions like the stay-at-home orders. And there's a number of reasons for this. Uh, one of them is that some of the interventions were not actually very helpful. We always knew that outdoor activities were at very low risk, and some very early work was done on that by Uncover. Um, so we could have uh, allowed people to, to go outdoors much more than they were, were in fact allowed to. We also knew very early on that the public health benefit of closing schools was quite small, and in my view, and many others now, I think too small to justify. Border closures and travel bans are more problematic. They do absolutely have a role to play, particularly in the early stages of a pandemic event. Uh, but in the UK, if you think back to the summer of 2020, they were chaotic, they came far too late, and the retrospective analysis suggests they were largely ineffective. Um, so those are, that's problematic too. The most problematic issue from my point of view is that our concentration, our emphasis on lockdown meant that we didn't do enough to protect those that we knew were most vulnerable to COVID-19, the elderly, the frail and the infirm. And some analyses we did in the summer of 2020 show that up to three quarters of the deaths during the first wave in Scotland were caused by infections acquired during lockdown. And the problem here is that people who are in that vulnerable category cannot completely self-isolate. They need care, they need social care, they need health care, they need to interact with the healthcare system. They may need to go to hospital. And all of those undermine the lockdown strategy. We, our emphasis, I think, was in the wrong place. Next slide, please. So how do we avoid lockdown for COVID or indeed for anything else that may come along in the future? Well, the first thing I've just mentioned, we need better protection for the vulnerable. And the most efficient way to do that, I think, is by protecting the people around them. And uh, we did actually end up doing that in the pandemic. 
better patient care turns out to be really important. The hospital fatality rate for COVID cases in Scotland came down over the, over the first wave alone from over 30% to not much more than 10%. So that's hugely important, massive difference. Uh, COVID safe protocols in workplaces and public spaces were effective. We even managed to uh, finish the professional football league season uh, using those sorts of measures. Uh, self-testing and supported self-isolation worked, but we didn't really get a grip on self-testing until late in 2021 when we were all given free lateral flow tests to deal with the Omicron wave. Infection control and prevention in healthcare settings and biosecurity from care homes were tremendously important. More than half the first wave deaths can be traced back to those settings. We should have been concentrating on those, not on things like closing schools. So we need to target our interventions in the right place. And that's helped if we have accurate and effective public health messaging. So the message we were getting from government in those early stages was the virus does not discriminate. And that's categorically incorrect. This was a very, very discriminatory virus. It targeted certain vulnerable groups much more than it did, for example, healthy young adults and children. So we need to be able to debate these issues in order to arrive at the right answer quickly. But quickly is the key word. One of the general lessons you learn from any pandemic response exercise is the vital importance of acting early. Next slide, please. And we did get better at that. Uh, this infographic we wrote, sorry, the previous slide, please. This infographic we wrote for the Scottish government uh, shortly after the Omicron wave hit. Uh, and what it shows is the various stages in responding, in this case, to a new variant of COVID, but also to a new pathogen more generally. So the threat is identified somewhere in the world. In Scotland, we first see it in travellers. Uh, then there's community transmission, and then we start to get data on the rate of spread, the severity of cases, the impact of our interventions, and public health decisions can be made. They will have to be made with limited information uh, and changing information always, uh, but the faster we can get that information to the decision makers, the more quickly effective interventions can be approved. And with Omicron, we got that down to 10 days, uh, which actually I think was quite impressive. Uh, it's certainly much more impressive than we managed at the beginning of the pandemic when the interval was more like 100 days, uh, and that was far too slow. Next slide, please. So would we lock down again? Would it be appropriate to have lockdown on the table, as the G7 report implies we would? Well, in some cases, it clearly wouldn't. For a foodborne pathogen such as mad cow disease, lockdown isn't appropriate. For a largely sexually transmitted one like AIDS, lockdown wouldn't have been appropriate. For a mosquito-borne infection like Zika, lockdown's not appropriate. Fecal oral transmission, such as polio, not appropriate. A monkeypox, which is spread mostly by very close physical contact, not appropriate. But for other infections, yes, it, they might be considered. Uh, the hemorrhagic fevers, there is some uh, uh, social distancing and partial lockdown now in Uganda to deal with the Sudan Ebola outbreak. But it's the respiratory viruses, the COVID variants, the pandemic influenza, which remains a threat, and the possibility that we get a third novel coronavirus uh, in, in uh, the coming decades. All of those are situations where, according to the G7, we might be considering lockdown. Next slide, please. So what do we should we take home for all this? Well, first of all, going back to the beginning of my talk, I think we need to consider very carefully what preparedness means and not equate it with a lack of vulnerability. We mustn't be complacent, some humility is due here. The 100 day mission being promoted by the G7 is admirable, but it's very optimistic. And rather importantly, and I think there's a bit of sleight of hand here, it doesn't include rollout. So they're really talking about two, 300 days. And the preparedness planning is almost silent across the board on how to plug those gaps. And it worries me that lockdown's not off the table, because in my view, if at all possible, we should plan to avoid it. I see lockdown less as a public health strategy than a failure of public health strategy. It's what you do when more sustainable and proportionate measures haven't been implemented in time. And the penultimate point is one that I'm sure everyone in, cover, in Uncover will thoroughly agree with. Public health policy must be based on evidence. That sounds like a low bar, but it simply wasn't the case in the early stages of COVID-19. That's very questionable. But the key point to me comes back to uh, this need to act quickly. 
one way to characterize the UK's response to COVID-19 was first, for the first two or three months, we underreacted and then we overreacted. Or to put it less charitably, don't dither and don't panic. And if anybody is interested in learning more about uh, my views and others on that, uh, I, I wrote a book on the topic published earlier this year. So with that shameless plug and with the next slide, please, I will end the talk and uh, welcome any questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Mark. That was really interesting and 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 very thought provoking. Um, we've got some questions in the chat, but I'm just going to take advantage of being the chair to ask the first one. Um, I think what the points you're making about the importance of acting quickly that really chimes with us um, at Uncovered, both because of what we were trying to help with um, during the pandemic, which was trying to get. Um, answer some of these questions more quickly and also some work that we did um, in preparation for the Scottish COVID inquiry which which really underlined the points you were making about although we had PCR testing really very very quickly the the capacity that the Scot that, that existed in Scotland for testing was I mean shockingly low for 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 right up into um into it for several months into the summer of um into the summer of 2020 and only really started to 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 expand after that so i guess my question is there are two sort of different points that you highlighted as being important for 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 acting quickly if we next time we're we're faced with this this a similar situation the, the first is quickly in getting the answers so getting the evidence, understanding the pathogen, understanding um, what works and what doesn't work, whether it's in terms in public health terms or in clinical terms. And the second is the rollout, getting the rollout much together much more quickly. So the question is, do you think that anything has changed, that we've learned anything, that we've got any plans to be able to do those two things more quickly next time? So, so far, I'm not convinced that anything has changed. And, and more important, I think some of the inquiries that have already started at WHO level haven't been convinced uh, that things have changed. The, uh, the, the WHO, I think, I'm afraid, does bear an awful lot of responsibility for this. They, they refer themselves to February 2020 as the lost month when not was not much was going on. Now, at that stage in the UK, I and a significant number of my colleagues were urging governments in Scotland and across the UK for early action on the basis of what we could see quite clearly was coming. But we were completely undermined in that because WHO, although in January they declared their public health emergency of international concern, they resisted calling this a pandemic until I think it was March the 11th. So when Uncover or me or the chief medical officer or anyone is telling the Scottish government, as an example, that we need urgently to build up testing capacity and get everything rolling, they can look at this and say, well, it's not a pandemic. The WHO doesn't say it's a pandemic. So I, I think we absolutely have to recognize the threat, quickly acknowledge the threat, and then it's possible to start moving the levers, levers and getting those interventions uh, uh, progressed as quickly as we possibly can. Thank you for that. So I've got a question here from Richard Mead um, and several other um, likes on this question. And I think, you know, you've you've answered it to some extent, but um, to what extent do you think that pandemic preparedness effectiveness is dependent on political decisions? Um, and I'm, I'm not sure whether that means political decisions at WHO level or at national level, but I'll, I'll leave that open. Well that, 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 well, that opens up a, a whole new discussion, doesn't it, about the relationship between science, science advice and policy. Um, and I, I think I think I, I'm going to duck the question and say this is something we're going to have to go to in great detail in the inquiries. And I understand that they are going to look at exactly that relationship. Um, but there are there are many examples for And the obvious one is no government in the world wants to go down, wants to go into lockdown. So when advisors are telling them that lockdown is the option, I don't think we should be surprised to find some resistance from government. Uh, and I, I think maybe we could have had a much more nuanced approach 
to not telling government not only what they had to do, but the ways they could avoid some of the worst outcomes like lockdowns. I, I think uh, I, I think we were a bit too narrow in in where we what we pressed government to do. Yeah, thank thank you for that. Um, so I have another question here from Emily. Um, what lockdown measures were in? Uh, when, sorry, when lockdown measures were introduced, there was a clear strand of thought that we should, quote, just lock down older and vulnerable people and let the rest of us get on with it. How would would you suggest that we strike a balance between targeted and proportionate pandemic management without just, um, you know, perhaps shunting vulnerable people to one side and excluding them from life potentially indefinitely? There's, there's there's two elements to it. So uh, so I thoroughly support in the context of COVID nineteen might be different in in other contexts of having efforts to reduce the rate of transmission of the virus in the community uh, because although the deaths were very highly concentrated in the elderly, fifty percent of hospitalizations occurred in the under seventies. So so the pressure on the health service was less. Uh, focus than the, the than the actual mortality rate was so so we had to do that but as i as i mentioned briefly in my presentation that measure of trying to suppress the virus in the whole community wasn't actually that effective at preventing the infections and therefore the the, the deaths and the illnesses in that vulnerable minority so i don't think it should be a very difficult argument to make that we need two things that we need to do both very important that we do both. We effectively only did one, and that, that I think, was a bit of a disaster. Um, but if you do do both, yes, there is some trade-off between the two. So uh, we, don't, we don't need to be completely extreme with, 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 with the level of protection we have to offer to the very vulnerable, but nor do we, the rest of us have to endure the harshest extremes of lockdown either. And um, the, the debate became very polarised. There's a perfectly reasonable middle ground here that surely we should have gone on to, and yet everyone was arguing very, very passionately for one course or the other, as if you couldn't do both. We could do both, and if we had, there would have been less damage all round, in my view. Excellent, thank you for that. Um, so there's a couple more questions before we, we uh, finish. So Sophie Scrimge is asking, um, what plans would, would you suggest or have been suggested um, for better production, protection of, of the vulnerable, um, especially elderly people in care homes um, for future pandemics. Um, and, and what did you think of how this was handled during COVID, which you've, you, you've, you've said a bit about? Sure. Well, the, uh, the, there are all the COVID safety measures that we're now you know, very familiar with, the masks, the hygiene, the screens and all sorts. So lots can be done to make uh, actual uh, contacts between people safer than they might otherwise be. But for me, the key thing is testing. Absolutely the key thing. So if, if the people around the vulnerable, so that's a lot of care workers, informal carers, healthcare workers, social care workers, and so on, are all tested on a regular basis. So we, we, and we were suggesting this, I was suggesting this way back in April 2020, April 2020, that this was a way to go. Then we know they're safe. Um, but for the reasons you, you highlighted, Ruth, we hadn't built up testing capacity uh, over the first few months and we weren't able to do that and we didn't do it. And, and I think part of it is for some reason we didn't get the message across that you can't get the virus if you haven't got the infection. You can't pass on the virus if you haven't got the infection. And yet that, and that was such an obvious thing to do and we didn't do it. Yeah, and I think, you know, as I've said earlier, that was one of the key conclusions in our um, preliminary paper for the for the COVID inquiry, that the, the, the la if there was one thing, it was that inability to get that testing capacity up and running and focused on, on care homes, particularly that... that um, but, was... but, si but since you've got me on the testing hobby horse, um, the... Uh, one of the most effective interventions, possibly the most other than the vaccines for the Omicron wave was the fact that we were all given access yeah. to self-testing. We'd had we'd had that technology for a year, over a year when we were first given it, basically. And during that year, we had two lockdowns, at least in most yeah. of the UK did. Scotland only had one. And severe. But, but, you know, that we were very, very slow to embrace that technology, too. And, and, and it's such an obvious way to make everything we do safe is testing. And hopefully we've learned that lesson. All of us as individuals have learned that lesson for next time that, we, you know, we got used to doing it. So so perhaps we that is one lesson we may have learned. <laughs> I do. I do hope so. 
Yeah. And then one final question from Richard Mead. How do we deal with the scrutiny of academia and evidence, largely through the media and social media, um, through, a, through a political lens, um, which we've seen particularly in the US and to a lesser extent in the UK? So I guess what you're getting at there, Richard, is um, that a lot of people have, 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 have faced attack, really, um, through for for debating these you mentioned yourself mark about the polarization for debating things that we ought to really be able just to to debate um reasonably yes i, I did have that as a, a bullet point in my talk didn't i the need for open debate uh at at, at a very early stage I mean, the polarization wasn't helpful. This this idea that Guardian readers were in favor of lockdown and Telegraph readers were against it, um, and and the idea also that if you were against lockdown, you were automatically in favor of more people dying, as if anybody would be in favor of of more people dying. Uh, Tom Whipple in the Times wrote, sorry, another plug, Ruth. I'm very sorry, but in a review of my book, he said he, in his view, the reason that debate didn't happen is because we got into a position where supporting lockdown had become, and these are his words, a test of virtue. And it became impossible to have the debate even among scientists in that, in, among scientists in that sort of climate. Um, so I, I think we do have to be a lot more open-minded early on, a lot more humble, I think, about uh, uh, and, and accepting that there may be other ways to go. What we tended to do was latch on to one thing and then insist, even when the evidence contradicted it, this was the best thing we could do. And the evidence didn't support that, but we wouldn't let go. Yeah, thank you. And I've got one more. I know we are running over time a little bit, but this is a really interesting question from Aditi Sharma, who's a senior, vet a senior veterinary officer in India. Um, and the question is, in the COVID-19 pandemic, the significance of carrying out COVID tests in wild or domestic animals was totally ignored, though one school of thought was that the origin of this disease is from bats. The guidelines were issued by the Animal Husbandry Department and Wildlife Department only after COVID was reported in tigers in the Bronx Zoo in New York. How do you see this and what impact do you think it had? Uh, hmm. Uh, the the impact i think in the early phases perhaps wasn't that great but as you as you move to a situation where you are at least locally trying to to get rid of the disease and reduce transmission as much as possible then of course you have to take account of animal reservoirs in in europe uh the mo we we've done some research on this in my own group uh the most effective animal reservoir was actually mink in mink farms uh and there were significant amounts of transmission as it happens the mink variants, which they became, which were transmitted, transmitted back to people working on the farms, but were not ever became serious human variants. But I don't think we could rely on that happening every time. So I, I think you're quite right. We do have to pay attention to all transmission routes, including those involving animals. Brilliant. Thank you for that. I'm sorry we've run over a little bit, but it was so interesting. Thank you so much, Mark. That was really a fascinating um uh, presentation. Uh, Suzanne asks, is there a um, recording? Yes, there will be a recording on our website um, later on. And um, everyone go and buy Mark's book. I didn't say that, but thank you. <laughs> I said it. <laughs> thank, thanks very much, Mark. Right, so we are moving on now to our second, um, our second session. We'll just move straight on. Um, so this session is going to cover three very different styles of uh, review, evidence synthesis, all dealing with pressing questions related to infectious diseases from an international perspective. So these, these presentations showcase some of the breadth and diversity of the work that we've been doing with Uncover um, and the different review styles that can help to respond to decision makers' questions. So just for some context before we start, WHO's Global Influenza Programme has been in existence for around 70 years, and its role is to support national health systems to respond to seasonal zoonotic and pandemic influenza. During the pandemic, the social distancing measures that we've been talking about were very effective at, at, trans at preventing the transmission of, of flu and other respiratory diseases, as well as um, COVID-19. 
But right from the start, the Global Influenza Programme recognised that there might be a resurgence of flu and other respiratory diseases such as RSV or respiratory syncytial virus, which tends to um, mainly affect uh, babies and children, um, once social distancing measures uh, were, were lifted. So the worry is that our immunity to flu will have waned or reduced because we haven't been exposed to it for a couple of years. So it might reappear very strongly now that people have gone back to social mixing as usual. There's been also quite a, a, a lot of uncertainty about how flu and RSV might behave alongside COVID. So will, might COVID change the way these, these uh, diseases behave? So, for example, how likely is it that people who become infected with flu and COVID at the same time, um, how likely is, that, is it that that will happen? And if it does happen, uh, are those symptoms likely to be more severe than if than if you just had a mono infection with with one um, disease, one pathogen? So for the past year and a bit, we've been contracted by WHO to do several pieces of work related to influenza in the context of COVID. So firstly, we've been conducting a living review. So this is a, a weekly bulletin which um, summarises newly published research on flu and RSV in relation to COVID. And then secondly, we've conducted a series of rapid reviews on a range of priority topics for the Global Influenza Programme. So we're going to start this session in a moment with a presentation by Emily McSwiggan on a rapid review carried out for WHO about co-infection of any combination of influenza, COVID-19 and RSV. Emily is a graduate of our Master of Public Health uh, online programme. She's a founder member of Uncover, and she's been the Uncover project manager since then, which she now combines with doing a PhD. She's a real star, um, which um, all of you who, who've worked with her will, will know. Um, and she was also the overall lead of the WHO Rapid Review team for the last six months. We're then going to hear about a piece of work uh, that in, in the second presentation, we're going to hear about a piece of work that has started recently. So this is a piece of work that's underway, but isn't yet complete. And this work is really interesting. We were talking there about the, the rapid testing that, that we all became familiar with during COVID. So this piece of work is on point of care testing in low resource settings. It's part of a much bigger study called the Diadev Project, which is a partnership between the University of Edinburgh, King's College London, King's Health Partners and the Public Health Foundation of India. And it's funded by the European Research Council. The University of Edinburgh component of this work is led by Dr. Alice Street. And this particular review is led by Dr. Janet Perkins. The background to this project is that in low resource settings, health professionals typically don't have access to sufficiently to sufficient laboratory testing. So they often have to rely on their clinical experience to diagnose the pathogenic causes of disease. And obviously that's challenging and it's easily results in, in inappropriate or un unnecessary treatment. It's unavoidable that that will happen. So the good news is that in recent years, new rapid point of care testing has become much more available and much more affordable, for example, for malaria, for Ebola. A key challenge now is to understand the social acceptability of this um, new technology, and that's the focus of this review. So we're going to hear from one of our superb volunteers, uh, Uncover volunteers, Sarah Nelson, and she's going to be presenting on behalf of the team Janet Perkins is also here, as well as fellow team members, uh, Eldad, Nadej and Emma. So they'll all be here as well um, uh, and may chip in at the question stage if they would like to. And then the final uh, presentation of these, this next uh, session is um, about our weekly uh, living review that we've been doing, that I mentioned with uh, for WHO. So this is our weekly living review of influenza, COVID-19 and RSV, uh, which Uncover has been producing for the WHO for the last year and a half or year, oh, just over a year. 
And this is going to be presented by yet another one of our excellent uh, um, Uncover volunteers, Alice Gornelwick. So Alice joined Uncover during her MPH and she's been working hard with us ever since. And she's been working on this particular living review since January 2022. So as with the previous session, please put your um, questions in the chat. And I am now going to hand over to Emily. Emily. Thanks so much, uh, Ruth, and apologies to everybody uh, that I've stolen your coffee break. I promise you will get one back um, later in the meeting. Uh, but as 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 Ruth said, um, over the last well six to nine months, we've been, we've been doing some work um, for the WHO's Global Influenza Program, um, focused around this question of uh, what's happening to um, influenza and RSV in particular, um, now that the, um, the the containment measures for, for COVID are abating, um, COVID is, is really becoming um, endemic around the world. Um, we have seen um, RSV and influenza levels go right down over the last couple of years, um, but we assume that that's linked um, to the COVID control measures and that, that, that those are coming back up again. Um, and we don't know what's going to happen um, you know, for especially to people who are are infected with um, some combination um, of these diseases, and and how that's going to play out um, in terms of their health outcomes. Um, so one of the pieces of work um, that the WHO team asked us to do um, is a rapid review, looking at the likelihood of um, severe outcomes um, among people who are co-infected uh, with with two or more um, of these of these combinations of, of respiratory viruses. Um, uh, so uh, this is a, um, a methodology that, that you will see um, several times over the course of, of the next two days, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, it's a, an overview of our rapid review methodology, which you can see um, is adapted from uh, a systematic review. So what we're trying to do here, and we've, we've spoken a lot already about the, the role of Uncover in trying to provide um, quick but reliable answers to decision makers questions um, in order to do that um, we have taken um, systematic review methodology um, which is a way of um, bringing evidence from different studies together um, in a really sort of systematic consistent um, robust kind of way to, to, to get good reliable um, answers about what, what the evidence says um, to do that quickly you you sort of you scale back parts of the methodology you you do um, uh, you, you ask one person to take on tasks that, that might otherwise be done by two people and so on, um, but you follow the same essential um, rigorous structure um, to try and come up with, with answers that are um, useful and um, reliable and that respond as far as possible to um, complex real world questions in the kinds of time frame um, that decision makers need those answers. Um, so we were looking at four outcomes um, for people who are who are co-infected with different viruses. Um, so we wanted to know um, what is the rate of hospitalization like? Are people more likely uh, to go into hospital if they have multiple infections at the same time um, than they're, if they're just infected with any one of these viruses? Um, once they're in hospital, is it more likely that they're going to be severely ill? So is it more likely that they're going to be admitted to, to ICU? Um, is it more likely um, in ICU that they're going to need uh, mechanical ventilation? Um, and uh, ultimately, what is the risk uh, that people will die um, from co-infections uh, compared to, um, to single infections? Um, when you start looking at it, um, we're, we're talking about three respiratory viruses. There are lots of other respiratory viruses out there as well that, that you could bring into this comparison. Um, but already, even with just these three, um, there are nine possible combinations. So um, when you start thinking about the, the breadth of evidence that you need to be looking across, that that is quite a lot. Um, you're comparing a, a co-infection of, of any two to, to any one of the others. Um, we focused in on these three because um, individually there is a, a a case for each one of them being um, a, a significant cause cause for concern. So I don't think anything more needs to be be said about COVID. Um, 
flu obviously is is a big killer every winter um and and um always has uh, pandemic potential so it's it's you know the the big one of the of the respiratory viruses that that we knew about before covid um and rsv um is particularly damaging among uh the youngest children and the oldest adults um and so um in terms of outcomes it it's another one that that needs um a particular focus and, and particular care so we we've just um kept focusing on 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 these three to begin with although um ultimately you could you could cast the, the net wider um and we found that there have not been um so far a great deal a great number of studies um looking at any particular co-infection uh, co versus any particular mono infection so um as you can see on on the top left of the slide um the, the bulk of the research that we found um, compared outcomes uh, from people who were infected with COVID and flu at the same time um, compared to people who were infected with um, uh, just COVID. Um, there's a little bit um, about COVID and RSV infection compared to just COVID um, and uh, a little bit about um, flu with either COVID or RSV compared to just flu. Um, there, there's basically nothing out there um, looking at, um, uh, well, there's, there's nothing out there looking at, at, at a combination of infection with the three, um, three viruses um, and very little looking at um, RSV as, as the, the single infection. Um, so in terms of, of what we found, um, the, the, stud, the, the pattern um, amongst these studies that looked at that COVID and flu together against just COVID tended to, to find a higher mortality rate among patients who were co-infected. Um, the, the picture for other severe outcomes, um, so for, for being admitted to intensive care, for having mechanical ventilation, was more mixed. Um, some found that, that there was a higher rate, some did not. Um, the, the quality of the studies overall wasn't great. So um, when, when that's the case, um, it just it limits the amount of um, reliance that you should place on the results being the absolute definitive picture of what's going on in the world. Um, and all of them took place in hospital settings, which means we can't say whether it's more likely that you were going to be admitted to hospital in the first place um, because we haven't looked that one step back. Um, so we're, we're looking at a group of people who are in hospital already um, and um, that potentially introduces other sources of bias as well, because, uh, you know, if you're if you're in hospital, you are already um, likely to be more severely ill. Um, and, and what what does that mean then for your outcomes? Um, in terms of, of the other sources of co-infection, um, almost all the studies for any combinations of co-infection um, found that there was a higher mortality rate um, among uh, people with co-infections compared to the single infection, whatever that was. Um, but we found much less information on the other outcomes of interest. Um, and uh, when that information was reported, again, the, the picture was, was more mixed. But um, I suppose it would be fair to say the emerging picture um, is one of there being um, a greater risk of death, um, at least um, among people who are co-infected. Um, compared to people who have um, a single infection of any kind. Um, but obviously, uh, there are, are limitations to, to how we should interpret that. Um, so as I said, the, the fact that um, all these studies took place within hospital settings, um, and also almost all the studies that we found, although we were doing this review in 2022, um, most of the studies that looked at this had taken place in, in 2020. Um, so way back at the beginning of, of the pandemic um, and they were limited by um, either not fully overlapping with an influenza or RSV season so you were probably not um, seeing the full pattern of, of COVID and flu or COVID and RSV interacting um, and also being in the very early stages of our understanding of COVID and our ability to detect and diagnose it so um, the uh, the sort of case definitions around COVID were um, were, were still emerging at that stage. Um, the most of the studies that we found, which involved RSV as one of the infections, looked at um, children only, but all the rest of the studies focused only on an adult population. So we don't really know um, what the effect of co-infections among children is. 
we found no information at all on um, participants' vaccination status, so whether people were already vaccinated against um, flu or against COVID. Um, so we don't know um, the extent to which that might alter um, your chances of a, a, a poor outcome uh, from co-infection or, or a better outcome from co-infection. Um, and overall, um, there were very small numbers of people um, who had multiple infections in any of these studies. Um, so the, the, the overall sort of um, sample of people that we were looking at was, was um, pretty small. Um, so there's a lot out there left to know um, that we don't know yet. And I think perhaps one of the things that's, things that's going on um, is there are so many potential different combinations of co-infection um, that I think the, the research that's happened so far has spread it out quite spread itself out quite widely um, and looked at many different possible combinations. Um, but the depth, um, you know, of having a lot of studies looking at um, one particular combination, say um, COVID and flu against just COVID or just flu, um, isn't there yet. Um, it probably will be in a couple of years, but it's it's an area where the where the evidence is still emerging. So we can say look, we're starting to see these trends um, in the evidence base, um, but we cannot say um, definitively um, that this is what's happening, um, that um, that people with co-infections are definitely more likely to have um, poor outcomes uh, than people with, with a single infection. Um, the other really important factor, which our review didn't look at, which we're hoping that a, a future update will, um, is the prevalence of co-infection compared to a single infection. Um, so, you know, part is the picture of understanding how serious a, a health problem this might be um, and the kind of response that, that we might need to put in place is, is knowing how many people are affected. So, you know, if, if co-infections are, are pretty rare um, compared to single infections, um, then we're talking about a different challenge um, in terms of scale. Uh, compared to if, if co-infections are are relatively common. Um, and again, we've got gaps in the evidence base when it comes to um, other serious outcomes um, in terms of, of intensive care um, or even of, of hospitalisation, um, which are areas that um, future research may, may want to, to delve into. Um, so I, I, I've lost my thank you slide and I, I'm really sorry to the team because that, that should be in there. Um, I want to end by saying thank you to a, a really wonderful team who who delivered this review. Um, it, it, uh, I, I'm presenting on this because um, two of our team members, um, Eldad and Damalola, are presenting on other things over the course of, of the next couple of days. So you will you will hear from them um, separately. Um, and two more of our team members, Jody and Harry, um, have just started new roles. So unfortunately, they can't be here this afternoon. Um, and Fiona has a very busy NHS job. So it's a really um, wonderful, high performing team. I'm just sorry you haven't been able to hear from them directly, but I but I owe them a huge debt of thanks for um, the work that they put into this review and um, just want to end by crediting them. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Emily. That was an um, uh, excellent uh, presentation. We'll see questions for the end um, and we'll move straight on to Sarah Nelson who's going to talk about um, this uh, uh, point of care testing a qualitative systematic review on uh, point of care testing and this is a work, piece of work that is as I said earlier is in progress uh, so Sarah are you yes I'm here thank you excellent hey thank you so much um, so as you know, my name is Sarah. I'll be presenting on our qualitative evidence synthesis this afternoon. So it's titled The Social Lives of Point of Care Tests in Low and Middle Income Countries. Our team is headed by Janet Perkins, our research fellow. We are also under the oversight of Dr. Alice Street. And the research assistant team comprises of myself, Eldad, Emma, Jasmine, and Nadej. And of course, we have the support and help from Emily as well. All right, on our next slide, uh, I'll talk very briefly about this because Ruth did a great job of introducing the DIADEV project. Uh, so Dr. Alice Street is the principal investigator of the DIADEV project, 
And the, the underlying notion of DIADEV is the idea of using social anthropology tools in the process or to investigate the processes involved in developing and using diagnostic devices, specifically in resource limited settings. And that is also the notion that lays the foundation for our project here. Okay, on our next slide, we have the outputs from Uncover. So here we want to highlight how different what we're doing is from the traditional Uncover reviews. So myself and most of our project team have primarily worked on quantitative projects with the Uncover network. And I think public health in general, not just the Uncover network, leans towards quantitative research. So this is actually the first qualitative evidence synthesis that Uncover has done, and we're really excited to be a part of it. I know the whole research team thinks it's just really cool <laughs> to be a part of this, this first qualitative piece of research here. Uh, so on that note, on the next slide, we talk a little bit about the differences. So a systematic review is something I'm sure everyone here is familiar with. And I think the most obvious difference between a systematic, systematic review and a qualitative evidence synthesis is, of course, that a systematic review is typically quantitative. Even when they're not, the methods still are more tuned towards quantitative evidence. Systematic reviews are also more specific and comprehensive, and they're designed to be reproducible. So there is a, a big emphasis on rigor there. The epistemology of a systematic review is also positivist, which means that the focus is on observed or empirical data, whereas a qualitative evidence synthesis, as the title gives away, they're really designed for qualitative evidence. Uh, it's a more iterative process. Here we're working to build theory, um, and the epistemology is interpretivist, which means that we are acknowledging that reality is socially constructed or created through participants' experiences of phenomena. So it really is different from the way that we're approaching our research question, our end goals, and the way that we understand the data that we're getting. But the differences will also become more clear as we go through the presentation. So on the next slide, I want to state our objectives first, um, but I'll begin by giving you a quick definition of POCTs or point of care tests. So we are defining them as diagnostic tools that do not rely on laboratory equipment. They can be conducted at or near the site of the patient and provide a fast turnaround for results. As Ruth mentioned, a very familiar example that we all know is COVID rapid tests. So the first objective of our project here is to generate overarching concepts related to the social aspects of the development, diffusion, and use of point-of-care tests in low- and middle-income countries to inform global and national health policymaking, programming, and priority setting. Our second objective is to map the state of qualitative and social science research in relation to uh, point of care tests in low and middle income countries to identify well and less well explored areas of evidence generation and develop recommendations for future research. Okay, so the next slide, we lay out the framework that we approached this question with. Uh, a lot of you might be familiar with other qualitative frameworks like SPIDER or SPICE, but the perspective framework that we've used here was actually developed specifically for qualitative evidence syntheses. Um, and this table below, this outlines our framework for specifically the mapping stage where we are now. So I'll just go through this very quickly, but the perspective that we're interested in is any stakeholders involved in the development, regulation, diffusion, or use of these tests. We're interested in a wide variety of settings, including research and development, policymaking, secondary and primary health service settings, and communities and domestic spaces. The phenomena of interest is the influence of place, people, and infrastructure on the development, diffusion, and use of point-of-care tests. And our environment is specifically under resource settings, and we're defining that as low- and middle-income countries. The timing is also pretty broad. We're interested in a lot of different moments in these life cycles of the point-of-care tests. So things like the supply chain management, storage, uh, interpretation of the final results, waste management, et cetera. And the final findings or themes we're interested in include the travel of these tests, user views, authorities and scripts, trusts, perceptions, practices, so a wide variety of different things. Which brings us to our next slide, which is our search strategy. So uh, Janet developed and executed the search. If you could move to the next slide, please. 
Thank you. Uh, so Janet developed and executed this search, um, and we developed a search string for research methodology, right? We wanted to identify qualitative research papers, uh, the point of care testing, so the actual item, the, the phenomena we're interested in, and for our setting, so low and middle income countries. And here, I just want to make a quick note that the search strategy is yet another way that searching for qualitative evidence is different than a quantitative review. There's a lot of writing about how difficult it is to develop the perfect search strategy to identify qualitative papers. Um, they're not always well named or using the, the exact keywords that you need to identify. So this is just another example of an added challenge for searching for qualitative research. And then on the right side of the screen, we have the different databases that were carefully chosen to optimize our search results. And I want to pay special attention to the gray literature. Uh, so we've chosen a couple different databases there specifically to ensure that the results that we found were not limited to the global north. Okay, on the next slide. So this next slide shows our search results. Right, so uh, the final amount that we had, and I think one more click might show the final number there. Perfect, so we, we ended with quite a few studies, as you can tell, after that initial search. And then on the next slide, we detail the deduplication process. So we used three different tools. We used EndNote, Deduplicator, and Covenants to get us just over 7,000 articles to proceed with our title and abstract screening. And on the next slide, we have a brief flow chart that shows that process of screening. So we went through title and abstract, moved on to full text, and then we ended with 127 studies to go through. The next slide shows exactly where we are now. So we are in the middle of our mapping and data extraction. So we are mapping on three different types of data or descriptive data. So things like the author, the journal, uh, the institution the author belonged to, as well as the funding body. We're also mapping descriptive data. So what is the type or the purpose of the testing question, the setting, the perspective, et cetera. And finally, we're also mapping the methodology. So what was the approach? What's the method of synthesis being used? And this step is designed to scope the qualitative findings that we have had so far. Our second phase here, uh, so on the next slide, is, is kind of we're on the precipice, right? After we finish this mapping, we're going to be moving on to our second step. So on the next slide, we'll talk about the synthesis. So I'll try not to, to go on too much, but in my personal opinion, this is the, the coolest part of this project. So our synthesis method as of right now is to be decided, which Coming from, from learning quantitative research methodology, that's kind of unheard of that you would start a project without deciding how you were going to synthesize your data. But there's a lot of writing about how qualitative research and qualitative evidence, right, it's an iterative process, something that traditional systematic review methods kind of go in direct opposition to uh, with the heavy note emphasis on rigor. So I think the fact that we're taking a more iterative approach is really validating and respecting the nature of qualitative research and qualitative data. Uh, and I think it's just really exciting that we're letting the data speak for itself. And we're, we're kind of evaluating as we go to decide on that final approach that will give us the richest results. So on the note of richness, that's actually kind of the key to deciding how we're going to synthesize the data. So right now, as part of the mapping process, along with the data I mentioned previously, we are also looking at each study for a richness score, which I'll talk a little bit uh, at the end. But um, depending on how rich our final results are, we're either going to take a meta-ethnography approach or perform a thematic synthesis. So the main difference between the two, I'm sure a thematic synthesis is something a lot of you are familiar with. It's that line-by-line -line coding of the included studies, organizing those codes into descriptive themes, and then using those themes to create analytical themes. Whereas a, a meta-ethnography would be systematically comparing conceptual data to find those overarching concepts and theories that are common. I personally have my fingers crossed for meta-ethnography, but we'll see. Uh, then we're also in tandem with that, we're going to be performing our critical appraisal. Uh, we'll also be doing a great circle assessment and then the final writing and dissemination of results. 
All right. And then our last slide brings us to final reflections. So as I've mentioned, this is different than traditional uncover reviews, and there are challenges that come with that. I think it's definitely been a learning curve. Uh, some of the members on our team are learning about qualitative methods and how to read social science data. Uh, it's, it's a whole different way of approaching a research question. So that's been really fun to, to learn and talk about as a group. Um, one of the challenges we had was with our inclusion criteria. We had a lot of conversations about whether or not we would exclude mixed methods studies um, or should we include them? How should we include them? We went back and forth, asked a lot of questions and deliberated, ultimately decided to include them, but only when the qualitative evidence was presented completely separate from the quantitative results. And then back to the concept of richness I was just talking about. I think that's also presented a challenge. So as I mentioned, part of our mapping, we're evaluating the richness. And I think that it's been a little bit of a crash course in social sciences and this whole concept of thin versus thick descriptions, um, because here we're really valuing different things. We're valuing the context and, and has the author painted us this picture? Is there information that we're able to gain from this study that isn't just in what's being said? It's those implicit meanings that we're looking for. Um, and I think that that has been a challenge also to evaluate, put a numeric value on how rich a study is, but also just the concept of richness in and of itself is, is new. And I think it's been fun to learn about and work through together. Um, and then I think with our, our mapping as well, right, quantitative papers, you're looking for specific end results to pull out when you're doing that mapping. Whereas with these, we really had to read every single line, right? Like a paper could talk about stigma without ever using that word. So I think that mapping right now has posed a lot of challenges, but we're really enjoying the process and we're all looking forward to the final results. And that is it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. That was uh, wonderful. It's great to see such enthusiasm. Um, it's very infectious. It's lovely to see and really interesting. So we're all looking forward um, to seeing how this project develops. That's great. Um, and so we're saving questions for the end for, for you and for Emily and for Alice, who's going to um, take us through the final uh, um, presentation of this session. And this is about the WHO Living Review that we've been doing for the last year and a bit. So this is the um, a, a, a weekly update of um, published research um, relating to influenza and RSV in the context of COVID-19. Alice. Perfect, thanks. Can you hear me okay, Ruth? Perfect. Perfect, awesome. Um, so, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Alice, and thank you so much for being here to listen to a presentation today on the Continuous Living Review, which has been commissioned by the WHO and has analysed the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on both influenza and RSV activity. Uh, slide please, Emily. Oh, next slide as well. Thanks so much. Um, so as you guys know, Uncover is a network of population health researchers and information specialists um, who are all committed to responding to the various requests from policymakers for evidence reviews with obviously previously a particular focus on COVID-19. Um, and in the context of this particular review, all of our team members are, are proficient in the systematic review methodology um, as current and former students of the MPH programme at University of Edinburgh. Um, I will be presenting an overview of this engagement on behalf of all these incredible people um, who have all made a significant contribution to this work. So next slide, please. Um, so quick overview, uh, a living review is a form of evidence synthesis, which sees a continuous review of literature, allowing for findings to be frequently updated, providing a current reflection on the most up-to-date evidence. Um, although a living review is uh, potentially less rigorous uh, than your average traditional systematic review, um, it is transparent and reproducible and obviously has the benefit of being a good for time constraints. Um, the current presentation focuses on the work conducted between August 2021 until July this year, but we hope to continue this engagement at the end of the month. Um, so as again, you probably all know, COVID-19 RSV and influenza viruses 
Our respiratory viruses and seasonal epidemics of these viruses are responsible for considerable morbidity and mortality. Um, RSV in particular has been directly associated with infections in paediatric populations since its identification um, in the 1950s. Um, and the drastic change in the epidemiology of both RSV and influenza during the wake of the COVID-19 um, pandemic in early 2020 globally has provided significant information regarding the circulation of these viruses in the global human population. Uh, for instance, following the closure of schools for young children across the world due to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it may be possible that young children are important drivers uh, of seasonal outbreaks of RSV and other respiratory infections in general. Um, so as a result, uh, therefore our work on the present living review aims to investigate the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the activity of influenza and RSV viruses. Next slide, please. Uh, so following on from this, uh, the flow diagram here kind of depicts the weekly workflow of this review. Um, it is initiated by the literature, literature research conducted uh, by Karen Hartnup and the Chinese literature team conducts searches of two Chinese databases as well. Uh, the retrieved records are deduplicated and uploaded to Covidence. These records then screened by title and abstract and then full text by two reviewers um, who assess the eligibility of each record based on the four themes which are seen below. Um, a single reviewer then extracts kind of key aspects of the study, such as study type, WHO region, uh, time period, and the overall study aims and findings. Um, a single reviewer also conducts a non-formal quality assessment of all selected studies. Um, and again, this is due to kind of the rapid one week turnover uh, of this review. Um, after this, this data is then synthesized narratively. Um, we conduct this work under four key themes, which are seasonality, which we define here as a periodic search in infection incidents regarding seasons or other calendar periods. Um, next is the epidemiology or data driven study uh, of health determinants or risk factors. Uh, we also have public health strategies which try to curb infections and finally we have national strategies um, which can include uh, measures such as legislation and policy. Uh, next slide please. Uh, just briefly, uh, this slide shows the search terms used weekly by Karen and the Chinese literature team. Karen uh, search, searches the WHO COVID-19 database and our Chinese literature team um, searches the CNKI and Wang Fang uh, databases. Um, so yeah, we're super fortunate as well, I think, to have a, a literature, a Chinese literature team who are able uh, to search these Chinese databases because um, this helps us expand the breadth of our literature and evidence. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, so above, we see the exclusion criteria applied to this review. Uh, this includes studies which is focused on either clinical features or immunology of COVID-19, RSV or flu viruses. Um, interventional studies have also been excluded, as have environmental studies. Uh, finally, studies that have reported any data prior to the last day of 2019 uh, have obviously been excluded due to kind of the most evidence starting to occur in kind of March 2020. Uh, next slide, please. So key findings. Uh, our work has led to multiple uh, insightful findings from different WHO uh, regions and countries. Um, there's a dramatic reduction has been seen in flu and RSV cases in the usual peak seasons. Um, and this was witnessed until August 2020. Uh, but the circulation, circulation of these respiratory viruses kind of resumed at pre-pandemic levels uh, after COVID-19 mitigation practices became less stringent. Um, the circulation of other respiratory pathogens uh, were also, uh, such as human coronaviruses, uh, flu, para-influenza viruses, were also reduced in early 2020 uh, and did not increase again until spring 2021. Uh, much evidence has indicated that flu virus activity was found to be at lowest historically during late 2020. Uh, reports of the frequency of co-infection between COVID-19 and flu varied hugely between studies. Uh, however, most studies reported RSV and influenza A uh, being the most common viral pathogens uh, in co-infected patients. Um, 
significantly higher flu vaccination rates reported throughout the pandemic, especially among healthcare worker populations. Uh, and this was found in multiple geographic populations and regions. Um, and finally, some studies reported leveraging influenza surveillance systems for the COVID-19 response. Um, so next slide, please. Looking uh, reflectively, I think a key strength of this review has been its ability to produce up-to-date evidence regarding the impact of COVID-19 on flu and RSV weekly and presenting these findings uh, to the WHO. Uh, the BMJ has estimated that 7% of systematic reviews, traditional systematic reviews, uh, are, are inaccurate the day they are published. Thus, in the fast moving and intense early days of the pandemic, this, this review was able to produce conclusions that were re relevant and updated weekly. Um, challenges have included conflicting evidence from various studies, yet I, I think this is probably a very common uh, problem faced with anyone using any kind of evidence synthesis. Uh, methodology. Um, the review has also followed a non-standard quality appraisal, uh, so a single reviewer has informally appraised each of the study, but this is obviously due to time constraints. Um, and I guess something which is much more of a positive challenge is that each team member, we've all had to develop our skills. Lots of us just had kind of basic knowledge from our MPH, so kind of getting uh, better evidence since these skills has been really beneficial in learning to use uh, software such as Covidence has been great. Uh, slide, please. Um, so our work has revealed, I hope, think some interesting findings that may be explored potentially in the future. Um, the finding on the impact of COVID-19 interventions such as face masks on RSV and flu infections has potential, I think, for further research, especially within numerous countries. It leads to asking uh, to what extent the trends of RSV and flu witness during the pandemic will have changed after COVID-19 mitigation practices uh, have been lifted. Um, findings have showed that there has been greater flu vaccinations among healthcare worker populations and the general public during the pandemic, potentially with thanks obviously to the introduction of COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, is there an opportunity to probably build on this and improve vaccination rates among healthcare workers and the general public going forward. Um, and finally, the findings of this review have highlighted the potential of the benefit of integrating surveillance systems uh, for future emerging pathogens, uh, which would likely have a significant benefit on future emerging pandemics. So final slide. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for taking the time to listen to this presentation. And I hope you have a good rest of the day and tomorrow and enjoy the Uncover Annual Conference. Thank you, Alice. And um, why don't you stay on and uh, we'll ask you a question. That was, th this is a great piece of work, um, which is sent, you know, weekly to, to, to WHO, to the Global Influenza team and, and is circulated internally. So it's, you know, has a very sort of ongoing impact, um, allows people to, 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 keep up to date on what's being published um, in a very digestible way. So I've got one question for, we've got, um, I think six minutes till the break. Um, so I've got one question for each of the three presentations. So Alice, as you're here, um, we'll start with you. Um, it's interesting you pulling out some of the conclusions there. So the, the, the question is, if you were to pick one finding or or piece of evidence that you've uh, come across in in doing your living doing the living review that you would really like to explore in in more detail perhaps do a review and uh, you know really focus on reviewing what what would that be what would you be really interested in um i think it would be using surveillance systems such as kind of flu surveillance systems and kind of creating and making wider and able to kind of view more respiratory pathogens and other illnesses. Um, I think countries have the ability to do that, some countries obviously, um, and, you know, things like face masks, there's been so much conflicting evidence uh, in this review regarding face masks and lockdowns. So yeah, I think the surveillance systems is a really interesting finding. Thank you, that's, that's great. That's uh, really, really interesting to hear. Um, about your your experiences of that so I have a question um for um 
Oh, there's another question. Is the Living Review published on the Uncover website or WHO website? Is it more widely available? Um, I, I can somebody help me out with that one. It's not. I think it's we send it to WHO and we are in discussion. I think with WHO about whether how how to publish it. Um, I think at the moment it's an internal thing for WHO. That's right, isn't it, Alice? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, because we, you know, we would like to put it on the Uncover website because it's a piece of work for them. It, it's it's for them. So so we um, hopefully at some point we'll be able to. Well, uh, you know, it, it will link to it if they um, if they decide to, to to publish it on their website. Um, so I have a question for Sarah, if you're still there, Sarah. Um, and this is a question from Aditi Sharma. And the question is, what kind of biases are you expecting um, to find in your work and how would you minimize them? And, and, and what are your and also what are your exclusion criteria? So it may be that this points to some of the differences in methodology. Um, and 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 perspective, I guess. But if you're, are you there, Sarah? Still? Yes. Yes. Oh, brilliant. Um, so that's a, it's a great question. I'll start with the exclusion criteria because I think that's a little faster because I might ramble for a bit on on bias. But so our exclusion criteria, um, we're excluding things like literature reviews, preprints, uh, reports, policy documents, that kind of thing. We're really focusing on rich, full fledged, qualitative studies. Um, we're, as I mentioned before, we're excluding mixed methods where the results are published together, state studies that are purely quantitative, um, survey-based studies as well, right? We really want studies that, that allow the participants to talk and, and see the information as opposed to just written paper answers. Um, we're also excluding setting-wise, uh, high income countries as the context of deployment. So that's really important. If the research is being done in a high income country, but the intended outcome is to be to have that research executed or impact a low and middle income country setting, we're still including it. Um, and then we also have some exclusion based on the type of test. So it can't need to, a laboratory to be processed. Um, it can't be an in vivo or a urine based POCT either. So that's the easy answer. So on to the question of bias. Um, I think in qualitative research, bias is a really important thing to acknowledge. And so there are a couple different ways we're addressing it here. First, we are addressing publication bias. Um, anyone familiar with qualitative research knows that that's never gonna go away, right? We do have issues with underfunding and publication of qualitative research, specifically in health related fields. But we do have both of our, our gray literature sources attempting to limit some of that publication bias. And we are including studies that are written in Spanish, French, and Portuguese. So we're trying to eliminate some of the English language bias. And I think one of the biggest things that you can do in qualitative research to further limit bias is reflection. Um, and it's something that we are doing a lot during the process. And I think specifically in papers like this, where we're looking at the distribution of certain health-related phenomena, like point of care testing, power is a really important thing to look at, right? The power of knowledge production. So where we stand doing this reading, as well as who the authors that we're reading about, where they stand, right? They can often represent systems of authority and there's often mistrust, unease um, when it comes to accessing health systems in low and middle income countries and within marginalized communities. So things like that are very important for us to acknowledge and go through. And that's also kind of incorporated into this evaluation of rich when we're looking at the studies. So I think reflection will be a big part of that final writing for sure to help us eliminate our personal bias. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, that's a great, very comprehensive answer. Um, excellent, thank you. And then the final question that we have before the break is for Emily on the co-infections review. And this is from Richard Mead. And um, so Richard's asking, um, were any groups defined by age, gender, deprivation, etc., more likely to get a co-infection? Do we know that? And to have more severe outcomes? Um, so, so do we know that or were the numbers too small or are there any indications? So that's one set of questions. And then the second one, um, I, I think you, you, you probably already addressed, which is how prevalent were co-infections um, pre-COVID? And has COVID made a significant, so, so co-infections of flu and RSV pre-COVID, and has COVID made a significant difference to the levels of co-infection? Um, do we know anything about that? 
I'll answer that one first because it's easier because I can just say no um, in that this this study didn't include um, a look at the prevalence of co-infections. That's something that we know needs to be looked into. Um, and I think it's something that we're talking about doing um, for a, a future update of this study. So I'm afraid we don't know um, at the moment, but it, it's something that we are planning to look into. Um, so maybe check back this time next year. Um, on the demographics, um, that was something that we that we plan to look into um, in the design of this study. It's something that we really want to understand. Um, so we we looked into every study for, for for those kind of patterns. We don't have enough evidence yet to to credibly say um, you know that this group is more at risk um, or there's a you know there's a trend um, affecting um, uh, one group of people more than others. Um, so. Again, I suppose it's a case of we don't have enough information yet, but that's not because we haven't looked. Um, it's because there aren't uh, many studies um, and there isn't um, a great deal of, of demographic breakdown um, within those studies to, to answer those questions just yet. Um, I think this evidence base is is growing. You know, it, it's it's an area of ongoing research. So hopefully it is a question that, that can be answered in the future, but just just not yet. Thank you, Emily. That's that's great. And we have now um, we're just two minutes over for the break. So we're going to have a break now for eight minutes, I think. So we're going to we're going to resume. So just time to grab a cup of tea. We're going to re resume um, at uh, 1540 GMT. Um, so we'll see you in about eight minutes. Hello, my name is Joana. I am a PhD student in Public Health at the Institute of Public Health of the University of Porto. I will present the results of two studies conducted among students and workers of our university. With these studies, we aim to estimate the seroprevalence of SARS-CoV-2 specific antibodies and its associated factors, the ratio between serological evidence of infection and reported molecular diagnosis among students and workers, and we also aim to estimate the incidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection among workers. So all workers and students of the University of Port were invited to participate. Participants answered a questionnaire on social demographic and clinical questions and a rapid serological test for SARS-CoV-2 IgM and IgG antibodies was performed. The workers were evaluated twice, as you can see in the figure. The first evaluation was from May to July 2020, and the second from November 2020 to January 2021. The students were evaluated once, from September to December 2020. We found a zero prevalence of 4.1 at the first evaluation among workers, and 13.2 at the second with a ratio of seropositivity to molecular test diagnosis decreasing from 10 to 1 in the first evaluation to 3 to 1 in the second. Among the students, the seroprevalence was 9.7 and the ratio of seropositivity to molecular test diagnosis was 7 to 1. In the workers that participated in both evaluations and were seronegative at the first, we found that 
10.7 becomes zero positive between evaluations and that the incident rate was 1.8 infections per 100 person month. So found that males and high skilled white collar workers were at lower risk of being an incident case. Students, we found that males and international students had higher seroprevalence of SARS-CoV-2 specific antibodies. So, in conclusion, we found that the frequency of infection based on serological tests was higher than reported molecular diagnosis, although this ratio decreased over time. We also found that social determinants such as occupation classification and nationality among workers and students, respectively, were associated with SARS-CoV-2 infection. Right, I think we'll start back up again. Um, just a quick, um, just a, a quick comment to to Emily. I think you just need to change the settings on your uh, screen sharing to remove the black box.
we'll let we'll let Emily do that. So welcome back, um, everybody. So this is the third session of today, the third of four sessions. So in this session, we'll start by focusing again on some of the work that Uncover has done to address decision makers' questions, but we'll also look at how that work contributes to our other primary focus, which is to build capacity and help to develop the next generation of systematic reviewers. So to begin with, Agnieszka Zavit, sorry, Agnieszka, I've been practicing getting your pronunciation right. Agnieszka Zawiska and Emily McSwigan again will present on two other rapid reviews that we've carried out for the WHO Global Influenza Programme. Both are related to infectious disease transmission parameters, one for uh, influenza and the other for respiratory syncytial virus, so RSV. This we're going to follow um, with a short interview with another member of the Influenza Review Programme team, and that is Megan Rust. Megan isn't able to be with us live, but she's done a lovely short pre-recorded interview for us, which will give you a student's perspective on the experience of doing systematic reviews with Uncover and the learning experience that comes with that. So we hope that if you're from um, you, you're not familiar with Uncover, maybe you're not from our master's programmes in the Usher Institute, you're from elsewhere. Um, we hope that you, it will inspire you and that you might um, be interested in joining us uh, for the future. So this, this interview with uh, Megan connects us directly to our final presentation of this session from Marshall Dozier. Marshall, I'm sure many of you will know if you're um, staff or student at the University of Edinburgh and particularly in the medical school, uh, uh, College of Medicine, Vet Medicine. Marshall is a, a, an award-winning librarian. This year, she won the CILIP Library and Information Association Presidential Citation for Outstanding Contribution to Her Profession, and that was for her work on Uncover. And it's really well, uh, well deserved. Marshall is one of our academic support librarians at the University of Edinburgh, working mostly with our deaneries in the Edinburgh Medical School. She has supported generations of students and researchers. So I remember being um, supported by her when I was first a student here, a postgraduate student here. Um, she, so she supported students and researchers for many years in doing uh, systematic reviews. And she's a founder member and linchpin of Uncover. So Marshall is going to present on Uncover's capacity building work. Capacity building for, for dealing with complex public health problems is a core aspect of Uncover's objectives. The development of methods, knowledge, skills and, ex uh, and expertise to carry out robust systematic reviews requires both an understanding of the underlying research principles and practical experience in the design and the application of the of the systematic review research methods. So the work um, that Marshall will present will give you insight into the lived experience of novice systematic reviewers as they become proficient. And you can see how proficient um, people have become through through working with Uncover. Um, so we hope that you find it interesting and it's a model that you find useful and, and, and might want to, to explore. So thank you, Agnieszka, Emily, Megan and uh, Marshall. And I'm handing over first, I think, to Emily and Agnieszka. Is that right? That's right. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this is um, another brief introduction to a piece of work that um, Uncover is just concluding um, at the moment. Um, these are two rapid reviews that we have done uh, looking at the transmission parameters of influenza and of RSV um, each individually. Um, and Yeshka, uh, who will be presenting with me, is uh, a, an absolute superstar member of, of the team um, on the flu review. So Agnieszka is going to focus on um, a couple of the transmission parameters for which uh, she is leading our write up. So um, we'll get to that in a moment and I'll hand over to Agnieszka. But I just want to say, um, this is Agnieszka's first review um, with Uncover. She joined us as a volunteer just before getting um, stuck in with this review. 
and she has been an absolute powerhouse. She has, you, you'll see in a moment just how big this review has been, and she has powered through it, um, uncomplaining it, Leon, with so much energy and enthusiasm. I, I am um, very grateful to her, um, and of course, uh, very much so to to the rest of the team. Um, so as I said, these reviews are looking at the parameters and the modes of transmission of influenza and RSV. Um, the reason why it's important to know about these kind of things is because it helps um, decision makers who are responsible um, for planning for likely outbreaks of disease um, to understand how the disease is likely to behave. In the case of flu, um, particularly, um, the WHO is, is interested in, in how regular seasonal flu behaves, but also how pandemic flu behaves. and um, what the differences between those two things are. Um, we were we were lucky in that we were picking up um, an existing piece of work that, uh, that another team had already done um, for the WHO to develop a set of planning assumptions which guide the, the current set of um, international guidelines on um, pandemic influenza risk management. Um, so their work, uh, that guideline was published in 2017. It was based on work that went up to late 2013. Um, so Basically, what we did here was to pick up the searches from that point um, and look at what new evidence has emerged from 2013 onwards um, that might help to um, inform, potentially reshape those, those guidelines um, uh, to make sure that they are as, as current and relevant as they can be. Um, uh, the, the, the things that you see on the screen at the moment, the, the parameters that we included with the review are um, essentially... Um, different characteristics that, that tell you about um, the infectiousness of a disease, the rate at which that infection is likely to travel through a population, um, the likelihood of a household being affected if somebody within that household is affected, um, and the ways in which we transmit diseases to each other. So whether it's it's carried in the air or it's by touch um, uh, or it is transmitted in, in other ways. So um, these are sort of the fundamental um, characteristics that you want to know about um, in order to understand um, how a disease is likely to behave and, and what the risk to the population is, is likely to be. Um, we looked at exactly the same kind of things um, for RSV as the subject of, of a second review. Um, there isn't currently um, a set of planning guidelines for, for RSV in the same way as there are for the flu, so we were not updating a previous piece of work. Um, we, were, we were sort of starting from scratch, so you know, we found reviews going back to the, the, the found studies going back to the, the 70s and 80s that, that helped in, inform the picture here. Um, and, and just um, trying to establish um, a similar evidence base um, for, for the way that um, uh, the RSV um, behaves and, and the infection risk from RSV. Um, so as you can see from these process slides, um, it was really quite a big undertaking. There were thousands of papers um, that our initial searches brought up. Um, and that's, I think, because we were looking at um, so many different parameters. So it was a really um, broad, open question. So there was a lot for the team to work through um, uh, in, in the case of both reviews. And they, they did a, a really fantastic job of doing that. Um, but the, the screening process um, where you filter things down from uh, what the original search finds to, to the, the papers that really answer your question um, narrowed that down quite a lot, as, as you can see. Um, uh, so and, and then when you split that out um, by the different um, types of, of transmission parameters that we were interested in, um, then the actual number of papers um, that answer any one of these questions is, is really quite limited. Um, as you can see uh, for flu here, um, we found uh, quite a few papers um, that relate to the attack rate and the secondary attack rate, um, uh, down to about <laughs> down to only um, you know three papers that, that tell you about the the duration of infectiousness. So um, there is, I, I mean, with 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 flu, you're you're, you're thinking we're, we're only talking about the evidence based from 2013 onwards, but but even so, you can see it, it's it's relatively um, limited in scale. Um, with RSV, um, even with no time limits on it, we found that that the evidence base was was really very limited. There were quite a few um, transmission parameters that we didn't find um, any information on at all. Um, and part of the reason why this might be is not because people aren't interested in this and because people aren't doing research on this, um, but because what we were trying to understand and what we were looking for um, in the evidence we searched for 
um, uh, answers the questions about how does this um, how does this disease behave in the real world. Um, so we were looking for studies that um, tried to um, find data and make sense of data from real world settings. Um, a lot of the studies in this kind of area are lab based um, or they are modeling studies. Um, and so they're the one step away um, from from the messy reality. They provide um, very useful information. Um, which, if you're trying to build up a picture of, of how a, how a disease behaves, um, it, it, it is valuable um, in informing your understanding. But they they were not, you know, what what we wanted to see was was, was what's actually happening out there, what what's happening in in the real world in terms of how how these diseases behave. And I, I suspect that that is one factor um, that that limited the, the scale of the evidence that that we found. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Agnieszka for the next couple of slides, and Agnieszka is just going to give us um, a deep dive um, into a couple of the parameters that, that we looked into. Yeah, I mean, thank you so much, and our pleasure is mine. So I'm extremely happy to working with you with, with our Uncover team, and thank you so much for letting me be a part of this presentation. So as you mentioned, we come across across a huge amount, a vast amount of, of uh, reference to screen, but at the end of the day, we just found us, found us a handful of, of papers which actually investigate in some outcomes or evidence outcome of interest. As far as a transmission mode is concerned, uh, we managed to find uh, seven studies, and most of them investigated a surface transmission in the community, uh, mostly household, but also public spaces like kindergartens or airport or also in a hospital setting. And um, the typical message conveyed by those studies was that the concentrations of virus were very low, with even a lower amount or lower proportion of, of this viral load being able to, to replicate, so showing some signs of, of viability in a further lab test. Uh, two studies investigated air samples, so studied um, aerosol transmission, and both those studies, both of them confirmed that there were viral presence in a um, across the all sides uh, of, of the particles. And the evidence came mostly from the Asian countries. Uh, there was the single European airport and the one multi-center trial in the UK. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, as for the generation time, uh, we finally identified nine studies. Uh, we could extract data from them. Uh, they mostly uh, they describe the influenza outbreaks across actually almost uh, from various regions of the world. However, we had uh, no data from Europe and Australia. Now, we also dealt with the sort of um, research heterogeneity. We had both data from observational trials, from prospective cohorts, for example, but also one study reported a set of uh, in, uh, gener generation time data from RCT trial. And uh, uh, most of the studies reported, um, as it mentioned here, reported the generation interval between two, sometimes one, up to three, 3.5. And the two studies also reported uh, on the um, influenza B uh, generation uh, interval. It was, uh, it tends to be longer uh, than uh, this reported for uh, influenza A. So it's as far as my part of, of, of results concerned. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Anishka. So that that gives a, a little bit of a deep dive into into two of the transmission parameters that we looked at for flu. And um, these slides are going to be um, available to you as conference attendees. What you will see over the next few slides, which I'm going to click click through very quickly, um, is that most of the parameters that we looked at for flu um, turned out to be um, very similar to the the parameters that that were. Um, included in the current guidelines. Um, we found a little bit more information, which maybe allowed some of those parameters to be um, to be refined a little bit more, um, but generally um, they, they added to and uh, reinforced the picture that already exists for, for influenza. Um, for RSV, um, as I said, we only, um, we only found information about four of the parameters of interest. Um, so, um, uh, in in that way, we began. We're, we're beginning to, to to build up a picture of, of RSV transmission parameters, but obviously there are um, a lot of questions left to be answered. Um, notably, um, understandably, um, but it, it leaves a gap um, with RSV studies. Um, 
the vast majority of them focused on on children, um, generally on very young children. Um, so generalizing from that um, to the population as a whole is um, is limited. Um, one of the really interesting things um, that this this study um, has done for us, um, I think, is to get us to think. You know, um, one one of the one of the key elements of um, developing any rapid review or systematic review is to think critically about the quality of the included studies. Um, what we had to do, and I think it's interesting to us all as people who are public health trained and and you know have 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 learned at least some um, epidemiology, is to think critically about the methods that are used um, to measure each of these transmission parameters, um, which are, are really quite um, fundamental things um, that you learn about how a disease works. Um, but actually, when you start to look under the lid, um, you learn about sort of different methods of calculating um, these different parameters. You think about um, how how effective and reliable those methods are, um, how much distance there might be between uh, the models that we use to calculate certain parameters um, and, and the more messy reality. So it's been that that's been an additional dimension that um that that these reviews has sort of engaged us on and it's it's been a, a really um interesting thing for for us to think about um so i just want to end again by saying a huge thank you um to the two wonderful teams um who have been delivering these reviews um and um yeah and thank you specifically especially to, to Agnieszka for for contributing to this presentation and to megan who um, we'll add her insights in, in the next. Thank you, Emily. So um, we'll go straight on. The next bit is a recorded uh, perspective from uh, Megan Rust. Um, so Megan is not able to be with us today. So um, Emily has recorded um, an interview with her, which we're going to, to watch now. And um, Emily's going to play that interview. Megan, thank you so much for, for doing this interview. Um, we're just going to start by asking you to tell us a bit about yourself and your background. Uh, so thank you for including me in the conference. Um, so I come from a completely different background. Uh, I was in marketing and I studied international relations and politics for my undergraduate. And then after some personal health experience, became fascinated with public health and enrolled in the MPH program at University of Edinburgh. Um, came across lovely Emily and the Uncover work and just really took a deep dive into it and it's been a fabulous experience so far. Wonderful. So Megan, you were part of the, the WHO um, flu review team. Can you tell us a bit about your role on the team? Sure. So I am a reviewer and it's a small team um, from people from different backgrounds. And uh, basically what we've been doing as well as reviewers is we go step by step through the systematic review process. And what's really wonderful about this whole experience as a student is it's a really safe space to kind of explore your strengths and weaknesses throughout the whole systematic review process. So it doesn't ever feel like you're jumping in cold. And, it's, it's a really great place to flex your different muscles and, and learn about different things. So were there um, particular skills that you, you felt you needed to have or that you, that you felt you developed as, as you were involved with, with the review? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think one of the biggest things would be getting comfortable um, like honestly, I feel like the one of the biggest things was getting comfortable. How, I'm not sure. Maybe you can help me figure out how to articulate this. Like coming from a different background, feeling like you have to know everything about everything within this world, and that was kind of intimidating. And then realizing, oh, you don't have to know everything. You just have to know and be comfortable to ask questions. I think for us, um, one of the key things about systematic reviews is recognizing that it's a team sport. You know, you're not expected to be um, 
an expert in every different part of, of doing a systematic review because you will always be part of a team and, and you'll always be supported by other people so yes yes that's exactly it exactly <laughs> i think you've helped me out there <laughs> no not at all i think that you have you've articulated something that um will probably ring true with with quite a lot of people and and i guess you know we've got um hopefully quite a lot of um, students and recent graduates coming along to the Uncover conference and thinking, oh, well, I'm interested in, in Uncover's work, but, you know, I, do I need to be a, like a pro-systematic reviewer to, to get involved with this? What sort of skills do, do I need? And I don't know, um, would you have any advice to, to people who are thinking about that? Jump right in, just do it. It's really fun and it's an exciting experience and you get to meet some fascinating, really kind, intelligent individuals from all over the world and learn a ton. Looks great on your resume and it's just, it's a fabulous overall experience. So if you have any lingering doubts, throw them out the window, jump right in and have a blast. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Megan. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Megan and so uh, Emily. That you you feel like you want to, to say that I haven't asked the right question for then. Um... I don't think so. I feel like a broken record every time every time I say this. But yeah, it's just it's been the. Sorry, I'll back up. Have you read that statistic? Or it's or what is it? When. <laughs> Okay, as women, you know, don't have men on this call, but as, as women, we'll only apply for a job if we meet like 100% and men will do it if we meet 80%, you know? Yeah. The, and that's kind of been in the back of my head, this whole experience with Uncovered, because it, it seems almost emblematic of, this is an example of something where you don't have to know everything and it's a perfectly comfortable place to explore that. So you can jump in with 80% of the you know, requirements because the part of the purpose is to help you grow as an individual and a researcher and, and learn a, a ton, whether, I mean, it sounds kind of cheesy, but I feel like I've learned about myself and what I'm interested in and how I work and engage with people throughout this process too. So it's, yeah, it feels like, it's like if one were to just strictly talk about just the like the actual research, you know, the more tangible bits that we've been doing, it would deny all the other benefits that students gain from the whole experience. If that makes any sense, yeah, it's it's the best learning environment I've ever been in by a long shot. Yeah. Thank you for that. And sorry for jumping in a bit early there, nearly ruining that. Um, that was lovely. Thank you um, to, to Megan and to uh, Emily for facilitating. And that's a really nice way for us to segue on to uh, the next presentation and the final presentation of this session, which is from uh, Marshall Dozier, um, who I introduced earlier. So Marshall's going to talk um, about our capacity building, um, the, the capacity building side of, of Uncover, um, which is, as, as Megan was highlighting there, just as important as the, as the outputs. So Marshall, over to you. Thank you very much. Can I just check audio is okay? Yep. Okay, super. Thank you. So uh, yeah, I'm Marshall. I work as an academic support librarian within information services at the University of Edinburgh. And today I'm very happy to share with you insights to the experiences of novice systematic reviewers uh, like, like Megan's um, as they become more proficient reviewers through their participation in the collaborative multidisciplinary reviews with Uncover. So um, Next slide, please. Sorry, I forgot I wasn't changing the slides. <laughs> um, here are the elements of what follows in this presentation. It's a bit of rationale for the interest in the development of expertise, the people and the context that I'm drawing on, sources that I'm drawing on in sharing this with you, um, summary of the learning experiences um, reported, and then some key messages that I hope might prompt you to think about how we are. Um, collectively doing research capacity building. Next slide, please. 
I'm using the metaphor of a bridge to capture the transition between being a novice reviewer and one with expertise, not because the step is one single transition between novice and expert, but because the journey needs to be supported somehow, whether it's with reviewer handbooks, with training courses or similar. Why do I think the transition along this bridge is interesting to us as people collectively interested in capacity development, capacity building? So research methods, including systematic review methods, are, I believe, best understood through practical experience, learning by doing and re reflecting and trying again. And as teachers and tutors, we often provide training and guidance on systematic review planning and other types of research methods to students and researchers. We contribute to the bigger picture of research skills capacity building by doing so. However, very commonly, student research projects like undergraduates or master's dissertations are designed as solo projects with a supervisor, of course. And that's in order to meet uh, assessment requirements. I hope that the insights shared here will help us to rethink the design of learning pathways for students and other novice reviewers for their journeys to becoming expert reviewers. Next slide, please. I'll give you a bit of context for this presentation now. Um, most of the novice reviewers I work with are earlier in their career as public health professionals. And today I'm focusing on the learning experiences of students who were part of the Master in Public Health, the, um, on which I lead a five-week course introducing systematic review methods. Next slide, please. And here are the learning outcomes of that five-week course. Bear in mind that the course is not an intensive full-time five weeks. It's extremely part-time. It's designed to introduce the principles of systematic review methods, to give students a bit of experience of each phase of the systematic review process, as well as in interpreting findings from other people's systematic reviews to inform public health practice and policy. Next slide, please. Now for the context of the real learning experiences that I've been reflecting on as part of Uncover and the sources that I've drawn on for this presentation. So thanks also to the approach of the Uncover leading team, it's been possible to have very collaborative ways of working. Our review groups are designed to have people with a mix of expertise. Each review is led by somebody with core knowledge and or methods expertise, but different levels of input to the review are available to other people dependent on each person's level of knowledge, skills, and experience. For the learning points that I'm sharing in this presentation, I've gathered feedback on experience from uncovered participants like Megan, but also from individual reflective reports, from meetings or our student forum, from group and individual discussions with students or staff working with Uncover, and from presentations or reports written by students or staff working with Uncover. Next slide, please. So here are three core points that I've distilled from the students' learning experiences. I'll, I'll share more detailed comments from the students in a moment, but I want to start with these core points because I think they emerge from the Uncover working model. So, Developing soft skills like communication, time management, teamwork, leadership has been very much valued by our students. The review team approach in and of itself has facilitated increased learning through peer exchange of knowledge and support, as well as through guidance from modeling or shadowing provided by more experienced reviewers. In addition to learning more about systematic review methods and the substantive topic of each review, the Uncover experience has given students an opportunity to increase their understanding of epidemiology, statistics, and to gain broader substantive knowledge about important health issues around the world, all of which add value to their Master of Public Health qualification. Next slide, please. So what is the bridge 
of this transitional experience like? So bear in mind the review team uh, approach I described earlier. This provides something like the legitimate peripheral participation that Levin Wenger described as part of situated learning, in which those with less experience work alongside those with greater experience and bec eventually become experts themselves. So to share some more detailed learning and learning points expressed by our students. And I'm going to, to name the, the students whose points I've drawn on here, um, many of whom are in the room. So it'd be interesting as part of follow on discussion to hear more about, um, get more insights from you on these points. So Eldad mentioned being able to recognize uh, where there is complexity in carrying out a project and uh, developing strategies for managing that complexity. Prerna mentioned technical learning in depth when working with uncover reviews, including creating complex searches. Nadej mentioned developing insight, discernment, and judgment in applying selection criteria. Tulani mentioned recognizing limitations of the tools that we use, like confidence. Dami Lola mentioned being able and having the confidence to adapt and create new tools like critical appraisal frameworks to, or data extraction templates to make adaptations to better suit the research objectives and data for a particular review. Kyla mentioned um, learning about the broader research context where actually there's a lot of research design confusion by other authors of primary studies and having to make sense out of that underlying confusion is, is a huge challenge for us as secondary uh, reviewers. Durga and Ashmika independently mentioned developing people skills like mentoring and leadership and resolving conflicts. And I have the great honor of having Durga and Ashmika as part of the tutoring team for the on-campus uh, Masters in Public Health version of the Systematic Reviews course. And I can tell you they are fantastic teachers. Rima and Emma independently met mentioned developing mutually beneficial uh, teamwork skills. And Ruth and Evie, our co-leads, have been amazing at modeling negotiation with our external partners and stakeholders, N negotiating with people who commission reviews in a really constructive and positive way is, uh, well, it's an essential skill. And Nene and Emily have also mentioned that students have, they've observed students formally and informally exchanging learning. And I think that reflects also a few points that Megan mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. So thinking about what an introductory course, that course I mentioned at the start has provided in comparison to that learning bridge of lived experience, the course provided a superficial indication of the reality of systematic review work. I do think it's important in a course like that to give a grounding in principles and core methods. And in the course, while we do have group work and activities that provide tasters for the different stages of the review process, necessarily we have very limited time and we use relatively uncomplicated examples. So that extended learning bridge that we've been discussing offers authentic teamwork and much more in-depth technical and substantive learning experiences. So, oops, next slide, please. What does this mean for us as teachers and guides for those setting out to learn about systematic review methods or indeed other types of research methods? In thinking about research capacity building, I'd like to argue that we need to provide more realistic and messy learning examples so that the reality of carrying out research comes as less of a shock and less of a surprise to our novice researchers. And thinking about robust systematic reviews and authentic learning and other types of research design as well, we need to think, I think, at looking at academic learning and assessment models and try to negotiate away from the standard solo student requirements for coursework and assessment to create opportunities for learning through participation with more experienced groups. 
Next slide, please. I'd like to thank all of those within the Uncover group whose ideas, thoughts, and feedback I've drawn on to create this presentation. And they're listed on this slide here. So thank you all for listening. I hope you've found that remotely thought-provoking and feel tempted to challenge some of our traditional academic practices. Thank you. Thank you, Marshall. Um, we are running a little bit behind time, but I really want to ask a question, uh, uh, one question uh, to you and then one question to Agnieszka and Emily. So let's start with you since you're here. I was, when I was listening to that, I was thinking that, you know, people often say that COVID-19 was one of these big external shocks. And when you have a big external shock, it actually enables you to do things that wouldn't have happened otherwise. And, and it certainly, you know, for us, that's what happened because it led to us being able to set up Uncover. So I was wondering, what would your advice be to your counterparts in other universities um, who might want to do something similar, but without the kind of kick that Uncover provided us with? Does that make sense? Mm, you mean with the, the co collaborative approaches? Well, how to how to be able to do something authentic like this, but but without having the impetus, the opportunity that we had because that was created by Uncover. Okay, um, I think I think it's possible that there's a lot of sort of academic regu regulatory stuff that I'm I'm sort of poking at there in 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 the points I've made there. So leaving that aside, because that that requires a, a um, quite a lot of um, institutional uh, change. Um, I think it's I think it should be relatively easy to do some of these things in small ways. So meet with, um, if you're supporting students in carrying out projects, arrange um, supervisory meetings that are in groups rather than individual. That can also have the effect of um, saving the amount of time with individual meetings. And I also, I think that one simple, well, it's maybe not that simple, but, but one excellent approach would be to, to use messy research examples and um, to, to allow uh, novice researchers and reviewers to see that actually uh, the reports of completed research projects are quite a linear representation of a process that was definitely not linear. Um, and that, that, that and working together with other people to uh, find their path through a very messy process um, it can really benefit their learning experience. Thank you. Thank you, Marshall. That was really great. And um, I love the slides, especially the cool bridge, which looked a bit scary. Um, you have to tell us where that, that is at a, at a later date. So just one quick question for Agnieszka and Emily. Um, it was really interesting, the transmission reviews, um, uh, transmission parameters review for, for flu and RSV and particularly all the gaps in the in the literature that you found when you were doing that review so it's just a really straightforward question if you were commissioning research in this area what would you what would be your number one priority in terms of transmission parameters for flu or RSV what would you want to focus on yes. Give me something straightforward but well described. Straightforward but well described. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I think it was my, my major problem. Uh, having things explained in a plain and, uh, and uh, transparent language in the papers. It was plenty of digging and thinking what the author thinks on the, you know, what the author was thinking about. And the, uh, probably a bit of, of the scientific research method was simply lost because of this. So uh, try to do things, uh, just let's try to do things simple, you know, straightforward, not, not be afraid of doing this simple way. I think that's a great, really great point. And it's something that like, as, a, as a teacher, I often say to students when they're writing assessments um, and, or, or writing papers or dissertations, don't, don't say things in a complicated way that can be said in a simple way. And I think often people say things in a complicated way in papers, actually because they can't, they're not quite sure what it means. Sometimes it is a mask for lack of clarity. So I think that's a really great, 
takeaway point. Thank you, Anishka. So it is now 16.20. We were going to have a 10 minute break, but I think we'll just have a very quick five minute break and that will get us back on track. So we'll start again at 16.25. And I think there may be some slides running in the background during the break. So if you come back and you see some slides running, it, it's just break slides. It's not that you've missed something, but we'll start um, immediately um, we uh, at 16.25 with our final session. And I'm gonna hand over to Evie, who's going to um, chair that session. Welcome back, everyone, for our final session today. I am uh, Evie Theodoratu, and I call it Uncover with Dr. Ruth McQuillan. I am very happy to introduce this last session to you. It will be a conversation between Dr. Aspen Hammond and Kirsten Duggan. Uh, Dr. Hammond joined WHO in 2012, working on zoonotic threats with a focus on influenza. Since 2014, she has worked with the Global Influenza Program on Seasonal, Zoonotic and Pandemic Influenza as part of the epidemiology team. She assesses global influenza epidemiologic and virologic surveillance data and develops guidance on influenza surveillance methods and standards and supports implementation. She completed her vet degree at the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine in 2002 and a postdoctorate Master of Public Health from the Yale School of Public Health in 2007. Kirsten Dagen joins us from Germany. She started her working life as a vet assistant before doing a master in health sciences. <clears throat> An interest in public health and in COVID motivated her to enroll in our part-time online MPH program in 2020, where she quickly got involved with Uncover. She's been an enthusiastic and committed contributor ever since. At the end of the session, you will have the opportunity to ask some questions to our panelists before we bring the first day to a close. Kirsten and Aspen, it is my pleasure to welcome you today, and we all look forward to your conversation. I'll better start then. I hope you can all hear me. Um, and. A big welcome and thank you for joining us from me as well. I'm so excited to be talking to you and I'm sure our audience will have lots of questions. Please again, put them in the Q&A box and let's get this started now. So Dr. Hammond, you are a technical officer in the WHO's Global Influenza Program, but what does this actually mean? Like, could you describe your work for us? Sure. Um, yeah, it's it's really nice to be here. Thank you. Um, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, and uh, good evening or good morning, wherever you may be. Um, yeah, so I work in the Global Influenza Program and that part of um, WHO. Uh, WHO operates at, um, at basically three levels. So at country level, there's country offices, um, there are regional offices, and then there's the headquarters, which is, is where I'm sitting. And um, a lot of the, the work that we do in the Global Influenza Program is to support countries to do influenza surveillance and use that information to inform um, response actions and, and policies. Um, we provide a lot of technical support and we also work, especially at the headquarters to coordinate a lot of activities. So to bring different um, partners together in the room to discuss things so that we can um, improve the health systems and, and help people um, live healthier lives. Um, and so specifically the influenza program works on um, seasonal influenza and zoonotic influenza and also pandemic influenza and preparedness for, for future pandemics. Um, interesting, interestingly, the program is quite old. Um, it's, it has existed in one form or another since 1947, um, when it was recognized that influenza was a global problem and needed a global um, coordination mechanism. And so this, this was um, in 1947, which is actually just before WHO's um, Constitution came into force in 1948, so we actually claimed to be older than WHO. Um, and 
And the formation of the Global Influenza Program then quickly was followed by the formation of a laboratory network called the Global Influenza Surveillance and Response System. So a network of labs and, um, and reference centers. And that just celebrated its 70th anniversary. So that's a bit of the history of the program. For me specifically, my work, um, so I work on, on the epidemiology team. We have a virology team, we have an epi team, we have a team that works on pandemic preparedness. Um, but for me, I work on the epi team. And a lot of my time, as you said, is, is looking at data that's coming from countries who are using um, their influenza surveillance systems to produce regular um, information on um, who's getting sick, where, what, what influenza viruses are causing that illness. Um, and, and we do this um, looking at all the countries around the world. So um, in terms of concrete outputs, we, we do produce every two weeks an update on the seasonal influenza situation um, around the world. Um, another big um, area of work, as I said, is that what we at headquarters are tasked with is really developing norms and standards and guidance. So we work on a lot of guidance documents for different aspects from surveillance to, to preparedness. Um, and we do trainings and we help countries implement these, um, these guidances. Um, and we, we help, we help countries, um, set up their surveillance systems. I, for example, I just, I just returned from, um, a trip to Cambodia where we helped them um, review their influenza surveillance system and, and make it stronger for, um, for future respiratory threats. So we provide that sort of technical guidance. Um, as I said, I also work on zoonotic influenza. So since 2005, the international health regulations um, mandate that anytime there's a, a human case of infection with an animal influenza virus, that's to be reported to WHO. So I also collect all that information and, and curate a database of, of all human infections with zoonotic viruses. We use a lot of that information as well as we work with our animal health colleagues and partners to look at the risk, um, do risk assessments. And what, what we're primarily focused on is looking at the risk of human to human transmission of animal influenza viruses, because that's, that's a, that would be a very, um, uh, a situation with a, a big serious impact to human health if, if new influenza viruses were transmissible from person to person. And I spend a lot of time working on other miscellaneous things as we get tasked. I work a lot on, on communication initiatives, um, trying to spread the word of, of, the, of the good work we do. Um, so uh, yeah, just helping out the team in, in whatever way we can. So yeah, that's a bit of the background on, on my specific work. That's already quite a lot and really cool. But like, of course, COVID-19. Have you been involved in that as well? Like, have you been dealing with the pandemic as well? Yeah, this, um, I mean, this has touched everybody's, uh, everybody's work, I'm sure, um, and, and especially ours. Um, I guess maybe uh, going back to, to the beginning, as far as I can sort of remember it, 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 it seems like it just happened, but it also a lot has happened since then. So um, I think in, in early 2020, we, um, we saw the value of of using our existing influenza surveillance systems to, to support the response to the pandemic. Um, so we, we, a lot of countries for influenza have syndromic surveillance where they monitor um, influenza-like illness and severe acute respiratory infections. So this is you know, people that are going to their general practitioner or to the hospital um, for respiratory infections. And we use that to monitor influenza activity. But we quickly realized that this, this could be helpful to also monitor, um, monitor COVID and especially to detect if it was circulating in the community um, initially. And so we, we looked closely at the, at the information and we encourage countries to continue doing this type of surveillance um, initially. Um, we also looked at um, supporting countries to uh, get samples um, from those patients that are usually tested for flu, but to get them tested for COVID as well. So that again, that, that we could try to detect early um, uh, when and where COVID started to um, be being uh, transmitted in the community. Um, in, in the middle of 2020, 
there was a multiplex PCR test for influenza and COVID developed. And so we worked really hard to get this distributed to all the labs in the, in the countries, the National Influenza Center, so that they could test all their surveillance samples for both viruses um, to get a good idea of, of trends and, and circulation. Um, and then later we started um, getting out documents um, on how to do this. And, and a lot of the work was on getting guidance on how to integrate COVID testing into existing influenza surveillance systems. Um, which sounds fairly simple, but um, turned out to, it's quite complicated. And, and one of the things that complicated is that a lot of the, because the people who work in the National Influenza Centers were so experienced with doing PCR testing for, for respiratory viruses, they were quick um, absorbed into COVID work. Um, and so, um, and there were also a lot of changes in healthcare use um, and delivery. And so the routine influenza surveillance systems were heavily affected. Um, and so we also worked a lot to emphasize the importance of continuing surveillance for influenza because we didn't, at that time, we didn't really know what was going to happen if both viruses were going to circulate or, um, uh, you know, or, or what was going to be the situation. So really emphasizing those things and helping countries continue. Um, I think that um, um, it was a lot of, again, a lot of bringing partners together, working with the countries, working with the labs, trying to maintain the surveillance in the context of many other response activities that were going on. So yes, yeah, so we were, yeah, we were, we were heavily involved and still are. Um, we're sort of in that period of transitioning from, you know, this, um, you know, surveillance in the emergency period, needing to find every case and understand exactly what's going on. And, and now there's sort of a shift to understanding, you know, what's going on with the severe cases and, countries are starting not to test everybody. Um, and so a lot of questions are coming from countries on how to set up surveillance in the future to be a bit more broad, um, broader than influenza. And so that's also an area that we're working on. That again, sounds quite like, like quite a lot. Um, is there anything else exciting you're working on at the moment? Anything? new and nearly still secret that you could tell us <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i think i think like as i was just saying looking we're looking at at trying to help countries move a little bit their uh respiratory pathogen surveillance system so it's not just influenza but incorporating other pathogens like rsv and sars-cov-2 and and whatever um other um viruses are, are of public health importance to them um and so expanding the system a bit to to be able to capture more of these um viruses and and, and respond to them and, and monitor the trends so that's one thing um I think there's there's a lot of projects and initiatives that we had started before the pandemic that unfortunately, like everything, had to be sort of put aside in, in the emergency response. Um, and for for our work, for part of the work that I do on the epidemiology team, again, as I said, we work a lot on developing standards for surveillance for the, for the epidemiologic side, and that's really well developed for the traditional systems, the, the ILI and the SARI systems, as I mentioned, um, but there's a lot of other systems that countries use to monitor influenza um, that are complementary. And so we, um, we um, starting in 2019, we initially did a, a scoping review to look at what other systems countries were using to monitor the trends of influenza. We finally finished that and, and published that this year. And what came out of that is that um, two, two, um, two major sort of categories of systems that were complementary. Were, one was participatory surveillance. Uh, if anybody participates in this, it's you basically get a, get a message every week to, um, uh, to indicate if you're sick or not. Um, a lot of these systems have been expanded during COVID, um, but it's a way of doing surveillance in people who may not um, be sick enough to see their doctor, um, but can report symptoms if they're unwell online. So it captures a, a different group of people um, for flu. And so we've, we're actually, we're, we actually finished um, guidance on that and just published draft guidance on that for countries who are interested in setting up those kind of systems. Um, that we started in 2019, but just finished. Um, 
and and the other the other major category of surveillance that we're looking at is electronic um, health records and and medically coded data and using that for influenza surveillance. And so um, we're starting with Uncover. We've started a literature review on that subject, um, and we're use, we're going to use that also as a basis for developing guidance um, because a lot of countries are already doing it, but we want to take their experiences um, and learn from it and make some, some guidance available to other countries who may want to, to start doing that. Um, so that's um, that's uh, some of the things that we had sort of had to put aside but are picking up again. Um, we also work a lot on, um, on um, assessing severity of influenza seasons. So a lot of times public health practitioners get asked or, or in the government get asked, you know, how bad is this influenza season um, compared to previous seasons? And we have had guidance on uh, for countries on how to do this using their surveillance data and thresholds. It's been complicated by COVID now. We have multiple viruses circulating probably um, in, in epidemics. And so we're, we're also revisiting that. Um, because uh, there's a lot of questions on how, you know, how does COVID compare to influenza? And, you know, if we have one wave of COVID, how does it compare to previous waves? So, um, so that's another, another area that we're working on. Um, I don't know if it's exciting to everybody, but it's, it's, it's exciting to me. Um, and we also, we're, we do a lot. I also, as I said, work on zoonotic influenza, and we have a lot of data on that. And, and really we have different databases and we're working really hard to consolidate them into one. So we're really trying to upgrade the, our data management um, so that we can have better um, um, outputs for the public and visualizations on, on, that, on that side as well. So that, again, maybe it, it's, um, it's not exciting to everybody, but, uh, but for us, um, it's, a, it's a big, it's a big uh, step and it would be really exciting to see finished. So um, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's enough for now on that. <laughs> Well, yeah, you said like you do the zoonotic diseases and you trained as a, like you study to be a vet, I understand. So like, how do you actually, how do you got to where you are? Like, how does one become a specialist in influenza with the, with the WHO and what is it like to work for something like as big as the WHO? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I I would love to say that I had planned this from from the beginning, but of course, um, that's not the not the plan. I don't think it's uh, I think it's very difficult to plan exactly where you want to be when you when you start out. But um, I, I always had an interest in infectious diseases and 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 health, um, probably more on the um, animal health side um, uh, as an animal lover. Um, and um, I, I didn't know at this when I was young, I didn't know that this kind of work, you know, that I would end up in this position, this kind of work was being done. Um, I'm grateful that I'm here and I, and I feel very lucky and I'm very satisfied, satisfied with the work. But when I started, I started actually as um, I started in engineering, actually, and then I realized that the school I was at had a veterinary school. So I quickly um, got drawn to that. Um, I worked, um, I didn't work in private practice. I worked in a very large um, animal shelter or refuge. I, it's sort of termed different things in different countries, but animal rescue center. And, um, and we had a really large hospital. Um, we, we saw a lot of, um, of animals every day and mostly sick from vaccine preventable infectious diseases. Um, so it was, it was very frustrating. And I, I found I was really lacking a good solid background in epidemiology if I wanted to really make a difference. Um, and so I decided to take it, take a year off and, and get a master's in public health. And I had the choice of, of doing a master's in public health at a veterinary school or sort of a human you know, medical school. I chose the human medical school or public health program more associated with human health so that I could, I thought it might give me a little bit more opportunity in case I wanted to expand sort of into the public health um, uh, area and 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 so I'm I'm kind of glad I made that decision. Um, and then after that, I think you know it's always about it's tricky. You know you have to balance work and family life. And I always had to my husband and I always had to balance one of us working, one of us being in graduate school for for quite a long time. So um, 
actually when he finished graduate school, we moved to, to Switzerland and, um, and I was looking for work. And so I just one day just contacted one of my public health professors and asked if, um, if he knew anybody working here in, in zoonosis. And, um, and sure enough, I had a contact and I started, um, I, I started working just a few hours a week. I had a young, I had a young child, so I didn't have much time, but I started working a few hours a week and had slowly built up from there. I really, since the beginning, I was really fascinated with the work work. Um, I tried to, um, you know, make myself valuable and, and, you know, find those areas of work that, um, that were really needed and, and just tried to apply myself wherever I could there. Um, and, and again, I think just because it's been so fascinating to me that, that, that it's been so enjoyable. So yeah, not a, not a straightforward path, but, um, I don't, I'm, it's hard to hard to find a, <laughs> a straight path. I think sometimes you just have to take the opportunities when they come. But exactly that it is not a straightforward path that I think that's actually really important. And so anyone who would like to, well, I won't say follow your career path because it wasn't that straight, but who would like to do <laughs> something similar, would you have any advice? Like, as you say, you, you found something that interested you and applied yourself to it. But is there anything else, uh, anything similar you'd like to share? I, I think, um, I think for me, yeah, just you know, as I said, I, I just reached out to one of my previous professors and, and, you know, it was a long shot, but um, it worked. And I think, and, you know, we've, we've supervised a lot of interns here. And, and I always say, you know, it doesn't hurt to, to send an email or to make a phone call to somebody that you want to speak to. The least they can do is ignore you. Um, but, you know, often the person is is nice enough and kind enough to at least, you know, spend a few minutes, um, maybe an hour talking to you about their experiences. So never hurts if there's something that you that you're interested in or somebody you want to talk to it never hurts to reach out to them. I'm 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 an introvert. It's not easy, but um, um, sometimes you just have to do it. Uh, um, and I think, as I said, that, you know, things don't always work out according to plan, but, you know, if you keep an open mind and, and a positive attitude um, and, and really just try to stick with what you're interested in um, and work hard, um, work hard on that. And I think, again, showing how your work is really valuable and relevant um, is, is, is always helpful so that you can, um, you know, advance in, in your career. Um, it's hard to keep up with a lot of developments, you know, in terms of, um, you know, IT and literature and these things. And so really trying to find, you know, that niche that you want to um, want to work in um, is really valuable because otherwise it can be overwhelming. <laughs> that it can be, yes. Now, I think we kind of need to slowly bring this to a close. But on a final note, the theme of the conference, as you know, is learning from um yeah learning from COVID but looking to the future so uncover is also trying to change its focus a bit more and looking at other health emergencies not only COVID-19 but also for example the health impacts of climate change um what do you think should we or is there things we have learned or should have learned from the pandemic that can also help us with with like dealing with future health emergencies yeah, it's a good question. I think we're all going through these exercises of of identifying lessons learned, um, and uh, and and it's really it's really fascinating. I wish we had more time to do it, but um, at the same time, we also have to move on. But um, I think it's really exciting for Uncover, and I and I wish you the best with this. Um, I think one thing that one thing we've always tried to to emphasize is. Um, at least for us, is um, is to build on what what's existing and and not to create sort of new systems. So you know, um, whatever what what works um, should be should be built upon and improved and 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 not uh, not sort of duplicated. We've we've applied that lesson for surveillance and um, and and trying not to not to have you know siloed uh, new systems being being developed. Um, I think in the in the response. Um, in, with, within our working teams, we really had to adapt quickly to according to what what was needed in the emergency. Um, we had to we had to 
we had to divide up our teams and start working with other people very quickly. We had to put aside our, our plans, uh, you know, sort of strategic plans had to be put aside very quickly so that we could focus on the emergency. And we just had to, to accept that um, as frustrating as it may be. Um, and, and I think, as I said, keeping up with, uh, during the pandemic for us, at least keeping up with, with all the preprints and, and new um, literature that was being published was very, was, was difficult. And so we were really lucky to be able to work with Uncover to, to help us with that. Um, but as I said, there were so many developments, it's really hard to keep up with everything. Um, what, what else? Um, I think I think the last thing was I, I was thinking was that um, just to just to remind ourselves that nothing was ever as simple as it seemed. So when we thought oh, it would be easy to you know distribute um, testing kits to labs, um, that ended up being you know weeks of of work. And so really you know having a good solid plan was um, was really helpful. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah, I don't think I have the magic answer, but um, just a few thoughts. Thanks. Thank you. And this has been really great. So thank you so much. Um, I think it's time for questions and I'm handing back to Evie because I think that's what she'll be doing. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kirsten, for this very lovely interview. And thank you, Aspen, for being so thoughtful and, and uh, generous with all the information you gave to us today, both in terms of your professional role, but also your personal path towards this great job. This has been really fascinating. And um, so um, I have a couple of questions um, that we would like uh, to ask you. We have uh, five more minutes. So the first one comes from uh, our audience and uh, it's um, one question about the current H5N1 virus that uh, has been circulating across the globe since 2020. Um, is the w, what is the WHO's assessment uh, for this virus in relation to the risk of human infection? And um, are we concerned about this strain's zoonotic potential? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> That's a um, yeah, very technical question. Um, it is a it is a H5 um, group of viruses that um, that we do closely watch. Um, so in a, in a couple of ways, um, one way is every, um, every six months when um, members of the, of the GISERS network, the Global Influenza Surveillance and Response System, um, get together um, every six months to look at the new, uh, how, to, how to update the formulation of the seasonal influenza vaccine. Part of that is looking at the zoonotic viruses that are circulating, not just the ones that have infected people, but also the ones that are circulating in animals that may have not yet affected people. And, um, and so those viruses are assessed for their, um, their sort of likelihood of, of transmission from person to person, which so far there's, there's no evidence of. And, um, and they're also, we also kind of assess their geographic spread and, and how similar they are to, to previously detected viruses. So how quickly are they changing genetically and antigenically? And so, um, so every, every six months, a recommendation to, to um, either update or keep the um, candidate vaccine viruses for those is, is done. Another way we look at it is through uh, what we, um, an, an acronym called TIPRA, the Tool for Influenza Pandemic Risk Assessment. And so this is done sort of on an ad hoc basis for different groups of viruses. And I believe this one was, this, this exercise was done for the H52344 clade uh, maybe last year. And I think there was a publication on it. I'll try to find the link for it, but, um, uh, this looks at, again, sort of the different characteristics, the geographic spread, the studies in animals, uh, studies in, in people, um, uh, number of cases in people, et cetera. So, but in general, um, so far, the so the evidence for human to human transmission there there hasn't been for this group. Um, the concern is it is spreading. Uh, obviously, um, it, in Europe and especially in North America, have had a really bad um, a bad uh, year, and so there's there's a lot of concern um, for the for the bird populations. But so far, there have been very few human cases, luckily. Right. Okay. Um... Thank you for that. And I have a question about the dreadful twindemic, twindemic that we hear a lot about whether we are going to have uh, uh, influenza and COVID uh, very high numbers 
uh, and this has not that this has not yet materialized. Um, will that happen this year? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could say. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's been it's it's been a worry for for <laughs> for now a few seasons. Um, I think it's still still yet to be still yet to be um, uh, determined. Um, I think what we've seen last last year, so um, in the 2021-22 season, um, we had influenza going going up in the northern hemisphere in, in Europe and North America it was going up, but then we had the Omicron wave. And so very quickly, um, you know, more public health and social measures were implemented. And so that quickly brought down influenza and COVID. Um, uh, so um, we there was kind of a, a, a bit of, a, of, of an avoidance of, of both of them going up at the same time. Um, I think now overall, I think that um, influenza is going up quite, quite quickly in North America. I didn't check Europe um, this week, but um, I think it was going up a few weeks ago also in Europe. In, in, um, and so um, again, we had this concern um, I think it's hard. It's getting harder to interpret the COVID data because there's such a change in the testing um, strategies. Uh, we're really trying to use the information from the influenza surveillance systems to monitor this, um, to see where um, samples are tested for both so that we can look mm. at the sort of relative co-circulation um, to give a, a bit more helpful answer. But so far, it doesn't... As yet, it's early to say. I don't know what will happen, and it's also linked. I don't know what how how acceptable it will be if COVID starts to go up. You know how acceptable um, re-implementing public health and social measures, masking, and these things will be, or or if the community says, you know, we've we've had enough yeah, of this. So it'll be interesting to see. Thank you. Yeah, let's see what happens. Um, we have a question from Krista Senzon. Uh, how are countries getting an accurate picture of influenza or RSV aside from testing in hospital setting? Are they looking at wastewater as well? Um, wastewater for RSV and influenza, not so much, but um, outside of the hospital setting. So, um, uh, so the, also in the sort of outpatient side, so people who go to their um, doctor, if the doctor is part of a sentinel surveillance system for influenza, um, periodically samples are collected from patients with um, with symptoms that meet the case definition for for these um, for surveillance for these two viruses. So samples may be collected and tested for both. Um, so that's um, at the outpatient side as well, similarly in the inpatient side as uh, in the hospital. Um, the other uh, the other um, uh, way that I mentioned, or a few other ways that I touched upon. One was participatory surveillance. So um, this is to um, get an idea of the um, influenza-like illness symptoms, trends in people who are sick but may not have gone to their doctor yet. So a lot of people just, you know, stay home, take medication, and may not feel sick enough to go to their doctor. And so, um, especially in Europe, these systems have been in place for around 10 years and, and have really shown to be quite valuable in, in tracking um, influenza seasons. Um, and some of these systems also, um, if you say that you are sick, um, some will um, send you a sample you can swab yourself and, so, um, and test that. Um, so it gives a little bit more confirmation as to what viruses um, might be circulating. And so that's been used for influenza. Um, and then again, as I said, the um, medically coded data can also be helpful um, to keep track of. It has to be sort of linked with some laboratory data to know, um, you know, which which viruses are causing the the syndromes that are being recorded. Um, but those, um, yeah, I, I would say that those are those are probably the two of the outside of the traditional ones, the two um, important ones. Perfect. Okay. Um... Thank you very much, Aspen, for the interview and for answering the questions. And we have also thank you notes in the Q&A session. Thank, thank, people are thanking you for those inspiring words and for sharing insights around your work. And I will now pass on to Ruth for our final uh, note. But thanks again to Kirsten and Aspen for this very interesting um, conversation. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Evie. Um, many thanks to all of our speakers today and particularly to our external speakers. And thanks, Aspen. I think it's really easy to forget, but wherever we are in the world, we all benefit from the work that you and colleagues do year in, year out. Uh, since 1947, although not you personally, since 1947, but um, you know your you, you, your your team um, to detect flu early and take um, action. So I, for one, am very glad that you are there doing what you do. Um, it's very reassuring. Uh, it was also really interesting to me personally to understand how the global influenza influenza program relates to the global influenza surveillance and response system, because I was always a bit confused about that. Um, and we, as as um, Evie was saying, we're really grateful to you for sharing your experiences uh, with us. WHO is an organisation that many of our alumni and our students, um, our postgraduate students, are really interested in hearing about from a career perspective. And, you know, it's particularly interesting to hear about the range of activities that you're involved in and also the range of really wide range of skills that you need to kind of draw on um, to, to, to do your role. So thank you. We are very appreciative. It was also excellent to have such a challenging and frank assessment of the pandemic from, pandemic from Mark Woolhouse. I don't know if Mark is still here, but um, thank you very much to Mark for his excellent keynote address. I think we're really lucky here at the University of Edinburgh to have access to so many people who played key roles in the in the pandemic as it unfolded. And as I was saying, um, Mark was quite a regular feature um, in the UK media um, and played a you know a really key advisory role um, on many um, UK and Scottish uh, committees that that had to make decisions during the during the pandemic. I think Mark raised some really thought provoking ideas for us to think about as we emerge from the pandemic and think about what needs to happen to avoid making some of the same mistakes again in future, particularly with regard to the speed of developing diagnostics and therapeutic technologies, but equally with regard to the speed of implementing these technologies. And it was really, it was really um, insightful to hear um, his thoughts on that. So as I mentioned earlier, the Uncover work that we've heard about today, the, the work for WHO and the DIADEV project, cover some really very different styles of evidence synthesis, all dealing with pressing questions related to infectious diseases from an international perspective. So the examples that the, the presentations we've shown today showcase some of the breadth and the diversity of the work that we've been doing with Uncover and the different methodologies that can be used to, to respond to decision makers' questions. We're going to hear about some different types of review again tomorrow when we present some preliminary results of work we've been doing for the Scottish Government on COVID recovery policy. So that, you know, a different set of methodologies again. This diversity of work is really exciting from a capacity building perspective because it's enabling our Uncover community to develop new skills in qualitative evidence synthesis, as we'll see, to, uh, and as we'll see tomorrow, in policy analysis, as well as in the more traditional public health and quantitative evidence based medicine type of reviews that we are more familiar with, and that Marshall's excellent presentation showcased uh, this afternoon. I said earlier that Uncover's mission is to provide evidence synthesis that is useful and relevant to decision makers. One of the challenges that we faced and that all people working in this space face is that many of the important questions that policymakers have don't sit neatly within single academic disciplines. They cross disciplinary boundaries. So when we're trying to synthesize evidence that's going to be useful and relevant to, to decision makers, we need to learn how to do that effectively, how to work effectively across disciplinary boundaries. I think we've made a good start in this direction with Uncover, but of course there is much further to go. And tomorrow we'll be focusing on the future and in particular on what 
is perhaps an even bigger and more complex global health challenge than COVID has been, and that is the interconnected challenges of climate change and loss of biodiversity and their impacts on, on health. If we to have any chance of responding effectively to these challenges, we're going to have to get much better at collaborating um, across disciplines. So for me, that this is the real takeaway from today. Um, it's been really great to see that there are people from beyond our Uncover community and coming along today, asking lots of fantastic questions and really engaging. And we would really um, encourage you to get involved. Um, uh, you can you can visit our website and, and contact us um, in that way. And in fact, um, if, if Emily is still here, she might put up a, a slide with our um, with our um, email address on it. So we we started making you know a, a move in the direction of, of of working across boundaries, but we need to keep going and we need to be open to outside influences and always look for opportunities to work together and learn from each other and develop new approaches and methodologies as we move into uncharted territories. So finally, I'm nearly done, and you can you can log off. Finally, before we go, I would like to thank, really heartfelt thank to, thanks to Lorna Heaney and Laura Marshall from the Usher Institute's communications team. As ever, they've done a superb and professional job in enabling this conference to happen and keeping us right. And we are really grateful to them. And I'd also like to thank the Uncover Conference team for their hard work in pulling the programme together. All our presenters and our um, interviewers, um, with Kirsten and Emily doing some interviewing um, today. Um, so on that note, thank you to everyone who's contributed to making today's conference so interesting and running so smoothly. And I hope we'll see you all tomorrow. <laughs>